Welcome back, everyone, to the Berserk Manga Analysis Series. It's been an absolute joy to go through this manga with you guys and to share all of my thoughts and feelings while I discovered every portion of what Miura put on the page to offer the world. It's been quite the journey to get through as much as I have, but there is still a decent chunk left to cover, and that is none other than the Fantasia arc. Quite an odd arc to talk about overall, though, for a number of reasons, but the most obvious being that, well, it's not finished yet. The Fantasia arc of the manga started in October of 2009, and now 11 years later, as of the recording of this video, it's produced only six volumes worth of content. To put that into perspective, the previous 11 years from 1998 to 2009 spawned about 20 volumes worth of content. So needless to say, Berserk's release schedule has suffered a devastating blow within the last decade or so. Multiple reasons for this exist, but the ones that you'll hear most often are one, because of Duranki, another ongoing manga series created by Kentaro Miura that premiered in 2019. And most people think that Miura is using that series to help train his assistants to better match his art style to ultimately have them work on Berserk. But other sources point to Miura being a very prideful person about doing Berserk himself, and if the artist did work on it at all, it would be mostly backgrounds and ancillary characters. Nobody is allowed to touch Guts's handsome jawline and muscles but me. And I completely understand that. There's also the ever cringy joke of Miura playing too much Idol Master to work on Berserk, because he mentioned playing the game in an interview once. We also need to take into account the man's age. He's 54 now, and he's been making manga since he was 10 years old. Not to mention Berserk has been around since about 1989. Berserk has been around as long as I've been alive, so, you know, maybe it'll end the year that I die. I've always kind of thought that in the back of my mind. But anyways, who knows? But fans that have been following the series for a while know the true struggle and theme of the series has been the wait for new chapters through various hiatuses, and the fact that the majority of them happened while the story had Guts and his merry band of travelers on a boat heading towards the Elf Island, making it the longest boat ride in the history of manga. Until Hunter x Hunter tops it in a few years, I'm pretty sure. But besides the outside, real-world problems of the Fantasia arc and its release schedule, there are also things that make the Fantasia arc very odd in its own universe, and things happening that make people think that Berserk has gone downhill starting at this point. Well, first we have a side quest story involving an island and a sea god, but it's not like Berserk hasn't done stuff like this before. The Lost Children chapters of the Conviction arc, or even the troll fight in Enoch Village, are similar to what goes on here at the beginning of Fantasia, but maybe it's the fact that people just wanted them to get to the island destination in a more urgent way than they had previously. Or maybe that it's unlike any of those, unlike Rosine, the Sea God doesn't actually serve as a character, just a big obstacle and a reminder of what the world may have been like before everything changed. Or maybe it's just that it feels kind of like filler. Maybe with everything Guts and company have done and gone through, the threat of danger wasn't as present as it was before, especially knowing that the Sea God Island isn't where the journey will eventually end up. After all, the first part of Fantasia is called the Elf Island Chapters, so you know they're going to get there at some point anyway. Maybe it's also the introduction of more magical characters, not the least of which on the island that has been coined by some fans as Lolly Witch Academia. And it goes hand in hand with a complaint that Berserk has gotten too cutesy with a bunch of little girls and exaggerated chestnut puck jokes as opposed to its more darker, brutal origins. There's some merit to this, but I would also argue that the dreamscape was pretty dark, and also I think the long gap in releases makes people more frustrated since in real world time, it's been a long time since there's been any big action moments in Berserk. And we also happen to have Guts in a stage in his life where he has pretty much conquered his Black Swordsman persona, with the exception of a few moments, and pretty much what we have to worry about now is the Beast of Darkness aspect of his personality rising to the surface, more so than his standoffish kind of brutal nature that he had before. But I digress. I'm not sure how far into the Fantasia arc we even are. We could be halfway, a third, it's really hard to tell. Will it be the final arc, or will there be another arc after this one? 
But regardless, I do think there is a lot of great stuff to enjoy here. But I can't really rank it among the other arcs because it's still unfinished. But I can tell you that there are plenty of scenes and moments that I cannot wait to discuss with you guys. So without any further ado, let's get started. I also want to mention that the word Fantasia means something considered weird, unreal, or exotic. And musically, it can also mean a compilation of different things. Fitting now that the world of Berserk consists of a merger of the physical and astral worlds. So remember, we are now on a complete entire planet that is overrun with supernatural creatures. Unlike the occasional troll or ogre seeping out into the physical world, now we have hundreds, perhaps thousands of them, here alongside with every other mythical creature that humans have come up with in their nightmares. The only safe haven in the world right now known to mankind is the Kingdom of Falconia, which has risen from the ashes of Old Midland and is ruled by none other than Griffith himself a paradise and a sanctuary for all mankind and apostle kind. And far, far, far away from any of that on the ocean is a giant warship known as the Seahorse, captained by the boss Chad man himself, Roderick, the true main character of Berserk. Well, I wish. And let's try to remember everybody that's on board, shall we? Long John Silver. Aye, aye, sir. Guts. Aye. Casca. Aye. Farnese. Yeah. Serpico. Aye. Shirke. Aye. Isidro. Aye. Sweetums. Aye. Puck. Aye. Ivalra. Aye, aye. Azan. Aye. Magnifico. Aye, aye. Big fat, ugly, bug faced baby eating O'Brien. Aye. And a whole bunch of crew of Rodericks that are basically there to be in the background and steadily be killed off from time to time. And following Roderick's ship is the pirate ship that Roderick had easily defeated before with his expert skills of badassery. The captain seems dead set on trying to redeem himself from his loss to the dismay of his entire crew. But they do mention the strange wind that they felt and how things have been unsettling ever since. It's a superstition, perhaps. Or perhaps we have the origin of a demonic villain so annoying that he puts Zondark to shame. I don't know, you tell me. But I also just want to point out this sweet page of a sea monster popping out of the water and having a bird for dinner. It's pretty awesome. And maybe it should have been a hawk. On Roderick's ship, Shirke is deep in a meditative trance while Isidro and the elves draw some pirate makeup on her. The best part, though, is when Farnese walks in and thinks it's part of a ritual for a new spell. I mean, I get that she's excited about learning magic and all, but I'd like to think she's at least being a little bit sarcastic here. Whatever Shirke was doing, she seems to have concluded that the wind that they fell and were struck by did unleash astral monsters onto the world and informs Roderick that the pirate ship on their tail contains something other than human. And of course, Roderick, the badass that he is, decides to go ahead and continue the battle anyway. He's like, oh, what, more monsters? Like the ones we fought in Vertanus? Gotcha, no problem. Man your battle stations. <laughs> this guy is a friggin' G, I'm telling you. If not for Guts being, well, you know, Guts, Roderick is the most manly character in this entire manga. So we learn that the pirates and their entire ship have sort of become absorbed into part of a larger sea creature. The boat itself moves like an animal, avoiding cannon fire, and the pirates show themselves as what I consider to be looking like rotted seaweed type creatures. And of course, Bonebeard recognizes Isidro and Azan from their little skirmish on the docks of Vertanus, and this brings up some deep-seated insecurities in him about his business being destroyed by them and I, his human trafficking I think he was doing or something. I, I don't know, he should really talk this out with someone. Now I know this pirate character is annoying as hell, and he won't be getting any better, and yes I understand the intent is for him to be annoying, but he succeeds so well in that aspect that it's almost sometimes unbearable and kind of makes me miss Adon Korbowitz and even I, I kind of miss I kind of miss Zondark too. Zondark. When the sea creature rises its tentacles from the water, things get really good. The tentacles themselves look like hands and can even pick up members of Roderick's crew and eat them independently as each one has its own mouth and eyes attached. And for a while it's a downright massacre. 
all leading up to Guts's heroic shot, first showing this POV of him walking up the cabin stairs, cracking his neck, and then showing several tentacles being absolutely eviscerated, all before this beautiful page of Guts acting so casual about it all. From there, as you can expect, Guts tears shit up as he usually does, and Bonebeard asks the questions that we all wonder. He then calls the rest of the creatures, and we see its true gaping mouth, and I got to wonder, we're dealing with pirates here anyway, but this creature looks so similar to how the Kraken looked from the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie, I can't be alone in seeing this comparison. But in the Pirates movies, they never had Jack Sparrow blast the fucker in the mouth with his cannon arm and then slash the hell out of it using the force of the blast itself. And after that, Roderick shows once again that he is a pro by having already set up the cannons once more, blasting the pirate ship up. But instead of getting a conclusion here to this battle now, we pretty much have Bonebeard literally twirling his mustache saying, Curse you! You haven't seen the last of me! as he leaves to avoid the morning sunrise. I suppose too the Bonebeard hate might come from the fact that there have been so many great antagonists in Berserk that going back to an Adon type character ranting over the top villain, it feels kind of like a letdown. But also maybe Mura just wanted to revisit this archetype and really this is probably the only spot left in the story where one could fit in. Before things begin to ramp up for the true final dark confrontation in any way with the new Band of the Hawk members that are all kind of great characters. But anyway, because of the battle with the sea creature, the warship needs repairs, and thus Roderick instructs his crew to dock at the nearest island while they fix things up. And just this simple plot device in general is great. Guts and company exploring a random island after the merging of the astral and physical worlds has happened. This island could be crawling with monsters and weird happenstances, and yes, it's still very side questy, but just the anxiety of not knowing who or what could be lurking on this island is super exciting. And Guts' brand is even warning them of the oncoming danger, as it's been steadily but slightly bleeding ever since the Astral World merger. Even the protective seal covering it isn't doing the best job. But despite this, Isidro runs off on his own, excited to explore the Uncharted Island. And I like how he says boys, islands, and exploring are like a trinity. There's some truth to that. What boy doesn't love venturing and exploring and finding hidden caves and places that the adults don't know about or wouldn't even dare venture? And if you didn't do stuff like that as a kid, I, I kind of feel sorry for you. Isidro does find a cave, but telling him not to go in is a young girl with hair covering her face and holding a pretty large fishing spear. And though Isidro can't stop staring at her chest, my man, she tells him that this cave is home to the sea god. It cuts back to the rest of the group walking, and I know this might sound really silly, but I love the order that they're walking in. Hear me out. So we got Magnifico first because he's oblivious and an idiot and doesn't understand where he is or what he's doing. But then really first is Roderick, the captain leading the team. Then we have Serpico, the quickest fighter right behind him. Shurike and Casca are in the middle as they need to be the most protected. And Guts behind everyone, which is like how in a pack of wolves the Alpha will sometimes walk last in order to make sure everyone is safe and moving forward. I don't know if the order of their walking was really meant to be anything profound, probably not, but looking at this panel, I was just like, yo, this this is perfect. Serpico questions Roderick about leaving his ship, but Roderick has complete faith in his first mate, and also as the man that he is, feels like it's his duty to escort the women through the island. Take notes, gentlemen. But anyway, as they enter what looks to be like a little fishing town, it seems to be empty of people. And we're entering into a very haunting, ghost town-like atmosphere, until Casca notices something. She pulls Fernice along with her to an opening in a rock formation to see something that looks almost like the head of a squid with its eyes closed. It's a statue of an ancient god. Shirke explains that things like these were considered gods before the widespread of the Holy Sea religion. And every time we get more glimpses and information on the Holy Sea, I find it dreadfully fascinating. It's like at one time the astral and physical worlds worked in a much more fluid way with one another. But as humanity thrived and the Holy Sea was brought into existence, the connection between the spiritual and humanity was weakened. We created an ultimate god to replace the need for things like sea gods. And of course, I believe that this is all in line with whatever the god hands or the idea of evil's plan ultimately is, but none of that really matters here. Shurike decides to go off on her own to get in touch with the spiritual side of this island and try to understand what she is feeling here. 
and the rest of the group enters a tavern where people are seemingly sitting in the distance but covered by shadow. There's even a cook that tells them to serve themselves, but clearly these people are not people, and Guts picks up on this right away. Meanwhile, Isidro's attempt to explore the cave was thwarted by him tripping over himself. The poor bastard. So the island girl took him back to her little hut, where she seems to have no issue whatsoever changing in front of him. All I gotta say is good job, Isidro, but all he can do is look in paralyzing fear of a naked girl in front of him. As she puts on her clothes, she introduces herself as Isma, and she excitedly wants to hear all about the world outside of her tiny island. Shirake makes it to the same cave where Isidro was just moments ago, and she finds the flame dagger that Isidro dropped, and just by stepping slightly into the cave, she sees the tentacles similar to that from the ghost ship. And then we get one of the best gags in Berserk that Berserk has ever done in my opinion. Shirke uses the thought transference power to see where Isidro is, just to make sure he's okay. And she sees through his eyes only to see Isma's cleavage <laughs> that Isidro cannot stop staring at. And I'm sorry if this is lowbrow humor, but I laughed my ass off when I was reading this for the first time. And hey, you guys should be happy. I'm enjoying Isidro humor. Come on now. So as Isidro tells Isma all about how heroic he is and has been in his travels, Shirke arrives to the house finding him and disapproving of him and then blaming him for her being attacked by the tentacles. Isma jumps with excitement at seeing Shirke, asking her the same questions about their adventures. And immediately, Shirke senses something odd about this girl. That this girl is not human. Isma sits Isidro and Shirake down to treat them to some potato fish and seaweed soup, and I honestly would try it, it doesn't sound that bad to me. Anyways, she's excited to meet with a witch that the great Isidro was telling her about. Great Isidro is likely a title that he bestowed upon himself, that's just a wild guess of mine. So Shirake was immediately able to sense something that was off about Isma, and it's all but confirmed as Isma herself claims to be the child of a human and a marrow, meaning that her dad was a fisherman who got down with a mermaid. Now I've seen the lighthouse and that sort of thing seemed like it would not yield good results. Actually now that I think about it, if I picture Willem Dafoe as Bonebeard the pirate, it kind of makes that character a lot more enjoyable. But anyway, I'm still not sure how the biological mechanics of having sex with a mermaid would work, but as you imagine, in the Berserk lore, mermaids are similar to elves in that they are on the positive spectrum of the astral slash magical creatures, protectors and spirits of the sea itself, regarded as good omens and rarely seen by humans. In fact, Isma herself has never actually seen a marrow despite fishing on the island her entire life, and her mother supposedly being one. She also claims to be an outcast of the island because of her rumored lineage. It takes it back to the legends and superstitions of the island and its sea god. Of course, I've talked before about how I think in the Berserk story that rumors and building up of ideas of different things can will them into reality, but it also has to do with remembering the past, and as generations go by, the true story gets murkier and murkier as the ideas spread. According to Isma, the sea god once ruled around the area, devouring people in ships, and when the full moon approaches, as most astral creatures do, it becomes more present and powerful, extending its tentacles deep into the ocean and attacking and controlling full ships, which explains what happened to our pirate boys. So it wasn't a kraken, it was just part of the sea god. Now up until this point, the most gigantic creature Berserk has presented us with was Ganeshka's Shiva form, which by all accounts was kaiju levels of massive and something completely unprecedented in this world, and something that was unnatural in its existence. But the sea god is so massive that it might actually rival Shiva to a degree, and it does occur naturally, if that's the right phrase to use about it. In my personal headcanon, and this is not stated anywhere in Berserk, just to be clear, but I would personally like to attribute the sheer size and power of the sea god to a culmination of mankind's general fear of the sea. The fear of drowning, getting lost, starving, fish, creatures, and monsters that lurk beneath its surface, and just the sheer size of the darkness that the ocean represents. They often say don't look too deeply into the ocean at night or you could be called in and never return. 
The mystery and grandeur of the ocean pulls on a deep, primal fear within us, and I would like to believe, again, it's not stated, but I would like to believe that the sea god exists as kind of a representation of mankind's fear of the unknown involving all of the world's oceans. And according to Isma, many years ago, the Maros were actually able to confine the sea god to this island in particular, perhaps trapping it until the great roar of the astral world awakened it once more. Thank you, Griffith. Back in the strange tavern, I like this little back and forth between Roderick and Magnifico. Even though Magnifico quickly got placed into the comedy relief category after his introduction, it was presented that he and Roderick are still friends to a degree, so I really enjoy them interacting together as friends. Also, I like how Guts is quiet and just focusing on Casca, keeping an eye on her. But in this next page turn, we get perhaps one of the creepiest Berserk double page spreads of all time. Roderick opens the door of the tavern to see dozens upon dozens of weird, fleshy, seaweedy looking people, these things, just staring at the tavern. Berserk has done epic and gory images galore in its entire run, but just as the dark, blank silence of this moment, I think it makes it one of the most terrifying and creepy panels in the entire manga. I don't know, that's just my opinion. From inside the tavern, the chef speaks, telling them that this is the full moon and the Easter of the Sea God. Maybe I'm being pessimistic here, but I don't think that that means the Sea God is going to be dressing up like a bunny and taking kids' questions in a mall. But if he did, I think Guts would react this way. Wait in line like everybody else. What the hell is this? This is for Brody. Instead, Guts just chucks a knife into the chef's eye like nothing, and the whole team prepares for whatever battle is about to come. It's them versus the many tentacles of the godlike monster. And it's great because at this point the team, well, minus Magnifico, they really know the score of what's going on. Guts begins his traditional hack and slash, Serpico takes out his sylph sword noting that it seems to be even stronger, giving that it's a full moon which increases the strength of the elementals within his weapon. Farnese controls the thorn snakes that she was given by Shurike, and Roger just old schools it with his trusty saber. That guy's a badass. And they make it outside the tavern where they are face to face with the reality of this situation. An insane amount of tentacles implying that the inhabitants of the entire island have all been assimilated into the sea god. Guts does every badass trick in the book trying to annihilate the onslaught without having to tap into the berserker armor. This means lots of cannon blasts, which are always fucking badass to see. Now last time he was able to manipulate the armor where he could use its potential and not lose his mind in the process, you know, the Batman guts. Meh. But before, Shurike was there to help him with that. Now she is away with Isidro, Isma, and the elves. And so Guts is basically on his own here for right now. And he stops to reload his cannon and actually come to think of it, is this the first time we've seen him actually have to reload it? I don't know, I just really like that little detail. But anyway, we get the return of, yes, Bonebeard the douchebag, I, I mean the pirate. I'm not going to go over a lot of his dialogue because it really is kind of self-indulgent and I know it's there for humor but it, it just annoys me. But his whole ship pretty much crash lands right in front of the tavern and it is also part of the Sea God. Remember we haven't even gotten to the full body of the Sea God yet. So far, our characters are only fighting its tentacles, which that's just insane. And as the pirate ship explains, once you become eaten, you become part of the sea god itself, which is the intention here. It's also an excuse for Miura to show off his skills, drawing massive splash pages like this of the tentacles, of slug creatures, and just uh, all around just madness. With this overwhelming circumstance, Guts looks to Casca, and I feel like here is just the simplicity of the instinct to protect. His face immediately turns away, and the helmet of the armor begins to take over, just like a parasite latching onto a host. The anxiety of Guts using the armor has been used a few times now in the story. It was used in its introduction against Grunbeld, facing the Pashaka on the beach, and when they were trying to escape for Tannis. So this is technically the fourth time, and by this time, even I have to admit, though the tension is still there, it does begin to lack an impact since Guts has managed to get out of the Berserker Armor Rage each time now. It's just the more you use it, the more you get used to it in the story, and maybe that's the intent as we will get used to it and then at some point the armor will be inescapable, who knows. 
My question when reading this segment of the story wasn't so much of would the armor give him trouble, but it was how he would defeat a creature that is what you would imagine a god to be. Not like the god hand with powers beyond our understanding, but just something that is so physically large and powerful, like the size of the entire island. Like I said, so far they're only fighting its tentacles. Could even the Berserker armor help with something like that? Well, Guts is gonna try, as he slashes through as many pieces of it as he can, including an iconic page and one of my favorite ever images of the Berserker armor in the entire manga. Just look how godly this page is. There's also this one as well with the cape folding down around the armor itself. And oh god, this one of him using the helmet of the armor to bite through the eye of one of the slugs. Just god damn. If anything, the art in the Sea God segment of the manga is worth reading it for just, just the art alone, I swear to god. Anyway, Shuriken and the others approach and she senses that the entire island has been assimilated. Well, the entire island except for Isma. Something to do with the strange ode that Shurike sends from her, no doubt, and also from the amulets that were surrounding her home. As in, she was meant to be protected for some reason. And Isma was introduced in this story pretty late, though it's relative to say late because we don't know how much longer the manga will actually go on. But who and what she is will have a direct purpose into this segment of the arc, but I also believe that her presence is important for what the Fantasia arc represents as a whole. But I'll get more into that one later. Shurke does manage to see Guts from a distance and attempts to connect with him on an astral level, but it's almost like the armor itself is rejecting her. The armor is magical in its nature, and perhaps because of the full moon, it itself increases the nature of the armor. Just as the sea god is assimilating people, it's almost as if the armor must assimilate with its host in a similar way, suppressing the humanity of the user in order to embrace their inner darkness and unleash it upon the enemy. Pasca begins to run off from the battle and Farnese chases after her right away, even slashing a creature on her way. Good for you, Farnese. One of the slugs appears before Casca, but Guts super jumps onto its back and just slashes it into pieces. Though the group is still unsure if Guts did that to protect Casca or if it was just part of his berserker rage. And once again, Serpico steps in front of the group to try to protect them in case Guts goes mad. This is the second time that he's done this, and I'm telling you, even though Serpico accepted his defeat by Guts, that doesn't mean that he automatically trusts him or that they're best buddies now. Serpico will never be to Guts what a Judo or a Pippin was. And I would say that Serpico is the most apprehensive towards Guts in many ways, and he is justified in those feelings. Just look at the situation that they're in. For within Guts, the Beast of Darkness, the manifestation of Guts' darkest thoughts, rage, and fears, is breaking its chains and telling Guts to yield himself into it. In order to master this Berserker armor, to master this rage, this negativity within him, it means taming this beast. But in their heated moments when the blood is pumping and his vision is blurred, how could he ever hope to do so? Well, that comes from another voice, one that's not his own, but tells him to look at Casca. Casca, the entire reason for his journey and why he's here in the first place. His love for her, the only emotion stronger than his rage. Being reminded by a familiar touch, this moment has also happened before. The astral form of a boy, the same one that was on the beach and mysteriously disappeared soon after. The Moonlight Child, as he is referred to by fans, still yet to be named, but most certainly the child of Guts and Casca. Guts' own child, his son, calming down his mind from within the astral realm and releasing control of the Beast of Darkness within Guts' mind. As Shurike and the others arrive, she jumps on this opportunity. I mean, like, she literally jumps onto Guts' back, trying to enter the armor with him as she did in Vertanis and to help him hold back the beast and control the armor as he desires. This image of little Shirake ripping the helmet back and pulling it off like pulling a mad dog off of a victim, it's, it's such an iconic image. And the wholesome moment after of Guts thanking her, and it just reminds me of why I love Berserk and why I love Guts so much, that after every hardship there's still times to bring a sigh of relief and still time to have gratitude and thanks towards the people that are helping you. 
But then the group notices the reason Casca ran off in the first place, that the Moonlight Boy is here once more. In no way it could be a coincidence. How could a little boy manage to travel the distance that they did and wind up on this random island as well? He traveled here by other means, and was just in time to help Guts, and again Casca was instinctively drawn towards him. Guts straight up asked the boy if it was indeed him that helped Guts restrain the armor, but the boy again refuses to speak in the physical world, or perhaps it's unable to, we're not really sure. Isma then introduces herself to the group, and Isidro pleads with Roderick to please let her join the ship, and Roderick being the, you know, super fucking cool dude that he is, he of course welcomes her. This is Roderick. Come on, the dude's a badass. The plan now for the group is to leave the island ASAP and hope that the minimal repairs to the ship are enough to get them where they're going. But Guts realizes that the Sea God will still be able to attack them at sea where they will be more vulnerable, and so he opts to take the fight straight to it. Meanwhile, Shirake will protect the ship and the Moonlight Boy will come along, I suppose, as it clings to Casca without saying a word. However, once reaching the ship, Shirake is entrusting the protection of the spell to Farnese. Farnese, who has been steadily proving herself that she is very useful to the group and is now tasked as its protector. Similar to how Shirake entered the Astral World and asked for protection from the four elemental kings back during the troll battle, Farnese will now have to do something similar. She has yet to truly master creating and maintaining her luminous body, the thing that allows her to travel through the Astral World, but with Shirake's guidance and the full moon enhancing astral power, Farnese is in the perfect position to accomplish this task, having the faith from everybody on board. How far she has come within this manga since her introduction, Farnese has truly become an incredible character, and I am sorry for ever doubting her. Meanwhile, once the protection barrier will be around the ship, once Farnese manages to enact it, Shurike will accompany Guts, well, astrally anyways, to help him keep the armor in check as Guts plans to go, by himself, straight into the cave that will lead him to the mouth of the Sea God. I don't think too many people would disagree that Lady Farnese Vandemian is perhaps the most explored and developed character next to Guts himself. The Golden Age arc gave us two amazing complex characters alongside Guts with Casca and Griffith. However, post-Golden Age, Casca has been stricken silent with the emotional capabilities of a child due to the traumatic regression that she experienced. This is part of the tragedy of her character, and the tragedy of Griffith is him relinquishing his humanity for the opportunity of a demonically divine continuation of his dreams and ambition. You could say that all three of these characters were transformed after the Golden Age. Casca to her regressed state, Griffith to God Hand, and guts into darkness so deep that his own inner beast manifested into the beast of darkness. All three of them are tragic characters. Farnese, on the other hand, is a character we witnessed take an opposite kind of arc, introduced as the leader of the Holy Sea Knights, and put into power by her father, whom really didn't know what else to do with her. Farnese had all the status, power, and beauty that a young woman could want in a quote-unquote medieval times era. All she had to do was be a good girl and let herself get married off someday. Everything would have been handed to her and taken care of. But it was a false, empty existence where she felt no connection or understanding towards anyone or anything. Locked away in a mansion, free to do whatever she desired, but alone. At last, she found her way towards the attention that she seeked, and to be praised and adored by the adults and to be accepted by them, partially due to joining in on the burning of heretics. She also had to repress her natural bodily desires, such as her sexuality, punishing herself whenever she would sway away from that. Deeply, she threw herself into the entity that was the Holy See, and here people would accept her. Here people would care and look up to her and give her attention, and she wouldn't be ignored. But it was a mask that she wore the entire time. She played the part of the Holy Sea Commander, and she played the part of the Heretic Hunter. She displayed her power over others and sat back allowing men and women to be burned or tortured, all to find a place where she belonged. I know this is a very simplistic recap of Arnie's character, but the point is, we begin her arc with her nearing her lowest point. And ever since the fall of the Tower of Conviction, Farnese has been building herself up to be a better person. This time, not just wanting to be accepted, but wanting to learn the truth about the world. 
wanting to open herself up to all the ideas and possibilities that were out there, and to unlock herself from the closed doors that the Holy See and the Vandemian family shut her in, and finally find freedom in that learning and understanding. Even opening herself up to the idea of magic, and how someone who once dominated and persecuted others could be redeemed themselves and become a protector. To think that Farnese from Volume 14 of Berserk could, now in Volume 36 of Berserk, not only be open to the idea of using magic, but to be actively doing it herself, by herself, and becoming the key defense protector of an entire warship. To enter into the astral world and call upon strength from the most powerful entities therein, the elemental kings. Farnese embracing her spiritual side in an honest and true unjudgmental way, not with force, but with asking the source to channel their immense power for the sake of her friends. And she manages to do it. She is allowed. She's granted permission. Farnese has progressed into a true witch, if I do say so myself. The shining bright light engulfs the seahorse warship, and just like when Shurike protected the church during the troll battle, but this force field is much bigger than that one. Not to suggest that Farnese is more powerful than Shurike in any way, but it's just more confirmation on how far she has come. Everyone is astounded, and she is thanked by them all, and of course, the thanks with the most meaning comes from this big hunk of a man, of Guts. Shirke then prepares to go with Guts to the Sea God Cave. This way she can connect with him on an astral level and keep him sane while the Berserker armor takes over. She even says that she won't let him go Berserk. Heh, <laughs> Shirke, title drop in the series there so casually. I see you. Guts allows the armor to activate and Shirke does her best to restrain the beast within Guts from overtaking his ego. Done with this really cool imagery here of her little fingers basically literally ripping back the darkness around Guts' eyes. She even notices that the ode of the beast within is even more aggressive than it was last time, as if it's just looking for a chance to fight and to kill, for which can assume happens every time Guts senses an evil being. That's part of the post-eclipse tragedy of his character that I mentioned before. With that, Shirake's body falls limp off of Guts' back, as she is completely focused in the astral world connected to Guts' consciousness. This puts Guts' helmet into the Batman mode. <sighs> I, I'm still not a fan of this design, you guys. I'm sorry. But he jumps off the ship towards the cave, and as he leaves, the Moonlight Boy still aboard the ship watches him closely. Upon entering the cave, even Guts can sense its darkness, feeling as though it's even darker than Clipote. I don't know, clip off, clipote, did I say it right that time? I, I got no friggin' idea. Anyway, inside the cave, there are some big slug motherfuckers, and uh, yeah, the uh, the pirate dude shows up again. He mouths off for a bit and then introduces the sea god itself. And the sea god is certainly intimidating, but design-wise, I don't know, it's pretty much just the giant mouth with lots and lots and lots of tentacles. I don't know what I was expecting when I first read this, but I was thinking about all these crazy mythological sea creatures in my head. The Kraken, Cilia, Tribdis, Cthulhu. But instead we have Mouth Boy. And look, I'm not discrediting everything that's about to happen. I'm just saying that the design surprised me due to its simplicity. But maybe keeping it basic actually works to its benefit. However you think about the design of the Sea God itself, the question still remains, how do you fight something that is so massive? At least with Ganeshka's Shiva form, he was up against an entire army. Here we have one Guts. And Guts just says, we go forward. Using the increased agility the armor allows him, Guts springs forth looking to jump right into the creature's mouth and kill it from the inside out. The pirates then decide, well, he's so fucking crazy he's gonna die anyway, so let's just go kill everybody else on the ship instead. Inside the mouth, Guts goes. And if Berserk wasn't fucked up enough, you can now add Vor to its list of inclusions. I just please don't don't go look that up, please. Anyway, after sliding down its throat, <laughs> God, what am I writing here? After sliding down its throat, Guts arrives somewhere inside the Sea God, seeing dozens of destroyed and swallowed ships, like a graveyard. You might be thinking, how does Guts even see now? I assume a combination of the Berserker armor enhancement and Shurike's guidance, and there's also a casual comment Guts makes about it being lightly glowing inside the creature. As some sea creatures do have a glow to them, I guess Mouthboy is included in it. They begin to hear what they think at first is cannon fire from the ship above, but realize it's actually the heartbeat of the creature itself. Guts plans to cut his way to the heart and pierce it. But first he needs to not only escape the dissolving stomach acid, but also these giant insect-like parasites living inside the sea god. 
yeah, it's super freaking gross. What did you expect? Miura was not going to just put us inside the belly of a gigantic monster and not make it disgusting. Oh well, I still don't think it topped the troll den in its nastiness, but it's a solid attempt. Meanwhile, Captain Roderick is informed of the oncoming demonic pirate ship heading towards them. And we all know Roderick is a motherfucking boss, and he won't let any harm come to his crew, especially his beloved Farnese. No, you don't understand. Even if the English translation is wrong, the intent is there. Roderick calls Farnese a goddess in command of angels. Oh my god, this man. I want these two to kiss so bad. Fuck, I would kiss Roderick. Roderick, you're so awesome. Look at that smile. Look at those sideburns. What guy do you know that can actually rock sideburns? That's right, Roderick can. Roderick orders the cannons to fire blasting into the slugs. They surge forward still, but with Farnese's barrier up, it works like a charm, burning up any of the slug bastards that try to get too close. The only loophole, just as when we saw the spell used before, is that it can only prevent evil astral beings from entering. Anything from the physical world still can. So the pirates rise their ship right up on the seahorse's deck and crash over top of it. And I guess the loophole also applies to the pirates themselves as they are humans turned into monsters. The human side would still be from the physical world and thus they're allowed through the force field. So that means that it must be their actual physical bodies that were assimilated into pieces of the tentacles and not a piece of the tentacle with the souls of the dead pirates, in case that needed any clarification. I don't know, it probably didn't, but there it is. So all our characters start to battle. Roderick and his crew, Serpico, Isidro, Azan still failing miserably at hiding his identity and calling himself the Black Mustache Knight. Oh well, he still wants to wear his own variation of the Cone of Shame, but I'd say helping defend the ship from demonic pirates is honorable enough to remove it. The ones that need to be protected the most are Shirake's body, Kaska, and assumingly the Moonlight Boy. But as we've seen before, the boy probably is more powerful than anyone else here. Okay, yes, then we have Isidro versus Bonebeard himself, and it's technically a rematch since Isidro faced him back in Britannus when he was a human, and it is semi-important as it shows Isidro's improved skills since then and how he's been slowly integrating all of Guts' advice into his fighting, from finding his own style and using his shorter height to his advantage, and we also get the tag team of Isma actually helping him by throwing something, a, a, a protractor, I, I don't know what it is, but she throws it right into the pirate's head, so that's some pretty good aim. And you know, it's kind of cute. And with her helping in that moment, it gives Isidro the idea to light the small bombs and throw them into the mouths of the tentacles. The pirates begin to all catch on fire and are forced to... <sighs> retreat. Yet again. Just kill them already! Whatever, it's a minor victory, and yes, we do have to primarily thank Isidro with the help of Isma. The whole crew praises their win, though with a special shout-out to Farnese from Roderick, who crowns her the Guardian of the Seahorse and the Goddess of Victory. Seriously, Farnese, what more do you need? I know he's not like Guts, but... Ah, oh well. Jokes aside, though, we know that that's what it is. Speaking of her development, as I did earlier, we cannot deny the impact of Guts, the Black Swordsman, in what he's done for Farnese's life. To view him as her savior in a way, and one whom guided her towards the truths of the world, has protected her at every turn, and had faith in her even so much as to specifically returning to get her after she decided to leave the group one time. She can't help herself but be attracted to him, and really nobody can blame her. Back inside the Sea God, Guts jumps high enough to cut a hole into the top of the stomach area which causes air pressure to lift them through it and into the next area of the body. I'm not sure what to say about this. It is pretty clever. It's also clever that it was Guts that thought of it. I don't know, maybe he learned something from watching Pippin. Guts makes his way to the heart following the pounding sounds, and when arriving, he sees it's probably close to three stories high. The air around it is thick, causing Guts difficulty breathing, and the intensity of the beating itself causes vibrations that continually push him back. I really like this. Think about how powerful a muscle of the heart would be for a monster that huge. This is its power source, and that power is felt even through the berserker armor meant to cut off negative sensations to the body. Suddenly, the pounding of the heart gets even faster and more powerful, and enough to knock Guts right off his feet. This is because outside the cave and the island, first noticed by the Moonlight Boy and then the rest of the crew, a piece of the island begins to crumble into the sea, breaking away as the sea god rises. Finally fully able to physically break from its island prison, it comes crashing out of the side of the island, dwarfing the warship with its arrival. Inside the sea god, dozens of large sea parasites and monsters 
Things that use the sea god for their own nourishment notice guts and barrel towards him, all looking like nasty worms, squids, and other bizarre sea life. So Guts will now not only have to cut through all of them, but actually be able to stand and get close enough to pierce the heart of the Sea God. And before I end on this segment, I want to touch on the notion of filler. As I stated in part one of the Fantasia arc, there are a lot of fans that regard the Sea God segment as a filler story. But I want to lay at least what I think are some narrative purposes for this portion of the story out. One is, like I started this video, is solidifying the full extent of Farnese's development. Yes, she had development in Vertanus when she re-met with her family and contemplated returning to her old life, but here in the new world of Fantasia, it shows who Farnese has become, and that despite those feelings of shame, uselessness, or wanting to regress, how she pushed forward into who she is now. It also solidifies the new Fantasia world of Berserk. After the blast of the astral world Femto let out, the Sea God now shows us just how different the world is, even so much as awakening ancient gods. And it shows the difficulty of Guts maintaining who he is within the Berserker armor. See, he needed Shirake to go with him in order to ensure that he didn't lose himself, meaning that he is still uncapable or not confident enough that he would be able to do it by himself and stay in that state. This is huge regarding to where the Fantasia arc is heading, and still heading in the unfinished manga in the newest chapters. Anyway, that's just my two cents about it. He is one chunky boy, and oh lord he's coming. The Sea God has finally been fully freed from his island imprisonment, and it's time to really stretch his tentacles out. Thankfully that means transforming the pirates into a full tentacle to use for itself, so we won't have to be seeing them anymore. But the Sea God just moving slightly through the water causes tidal waves rocking the seahorse warship. Now let's be honest, I'm sure Roderick has had this seahorse rocking a few times before, if you know what I'm saying, but this is a little bit different from that. The waves are strong enough to knock Isidro overboard, and before I can celebrate too much, Isma jumps right in after him. I gotta appreciate her loyalty and determination here, but it's almost as if she felt some sort of calling from the water, that jumping headfirst into a raging sea wouldn't exactly cause her that much difficulty. As she grabs the Cedro and tries to get him to the surface while evading the tentacles, she hears a voice in her head that whispers something about speaking aloud her true name. And before we can learn what that is or what that means, we see Yzma undergo a transformation of sorts, morphing her lower body into a fishtail while overall having a more aquatic appearance. She jumps with Isidro high out of the water with the full moon as the backdrop that works great as imagery but also reminds us too that the full moon will always have an effect on increasing the connection to astral entities. When they land back on the ship, it seems that Yzma is not even fully aware of the transformation she has undergone as the entire crew gawks at her and Isidro tries to say the word tail but can only get out the T sound. Yzma just assumes that he means to say tits and is like, yeah, so what, no big deal. And look, Isidro is supposed to be, what, 13, 14? And if he was anything like me at that age, honestly, I wouldn't even be surprised that even with a girl with a fishtail in front of him, that he would still just be looking at her chest instead. But no, Isma does notice that she now has a fishtail and jumps around in astonishment as the crew is unsure of what to make of this development. But I do like when Isidro defends her saying, yeah, she's a marrow, she's got a tail, so what, you got a problem? Good on him for defending his new fishy girlfriend. But then we get the information that Isma heard someone whisper her true name, which is said to have caused her transformation, something that's never happened before. If Valera starts to tell her that astral entities all have a true name, and that if anyone were to learn of that name, they would have power over the astral creature. Now, this is a very strange piece of information. Because of a few factors, first of all, as I mentioned in my Monster Manual video for Marrows, that'll be linked down in the description below if you want to go watch it, similar to the original mythology of Marrows, when they would come ashore, they would have with them a cloak of some sort. Discarding that cloak, they would transform into human form. Legends say that fishermen would find these cloaks, and with it in their possession, they would have power over the Marrows, and oftentimes force them to stay with them ashore, and even have their children. Only upon retrieving the possession of the cloak, would the marrow be able to transform back into their marrow self and return to the ocean. So, in the story of Isma, her father being a fisherman and her mother being a marrow, it would make some sense that the berserk version of the original mythology would switch from a cloak to a true name to have possession of. But, 
According to Avalara, this name scenario applies to astral creatures in general. This seems like a big deal, and it's shocking that this has never been brought up until now. How has Puck never mentioned this to Guts in their travels, at least at some point? And is Puck even his true name? I don't know, this is all so strange. Also, it is incredibly vague as to what Avalara means by someone knowing that name gives them control over you. How much control? Are we talking about just an influence or a full-on go-and-do-my-bidding type control? I don't know, and I don't want to overthink things too much here, but the information given to us at this time is so small, and yet the implications can be so vast. Also, I don't think it would be thrown in here just because, and if it were to only apply to the Marrows, Miura wouldn't have made it a point for Ivalara to mention all astral creatures. Now, I have a couple of small theories of what this could apply to later on. One is dealing with a character that's currently on the ship, and that's the Moonlight Boy, a character that is yet unnamed. If we are going with the theory that the Moonlight Child and Griffith share the same physical body, then perhaps knowing the true name of the boy could make him appear at will or give him more control over the body. And perhaps the only person that could know his true name is Casca herself, as the mother has every right to name her child, and maybe she's known it for a long time in the deep recesses of her mind, but hasn't been able to communicate it because of her current state. And then there is also the big elephant in the room, which is Griffith, that we as the audience know is actually a God Hand member named Femto. Think about it. Do any of the protagonists even know that that's his name? Yes, it was spoken at the Eclipse, but the only person at that time that could have possibly heard it was Guts, and he was so full of rage and emotion, would he have even processed or remembered it from then? Hell, remember at this point in the story, most of Guts' crew doesn't even know who Griffith slash Femto is, or at the very least, doesn't know that he's in any way connected to Guts. Also again, how much control are we talking about when it comes to knowing the true astral name? It's just, it's all so vague, and I'm spending way too much time on this, I know, but it's so random and interesting as far as the lore of the series goes, and I have to know what it can all mean and how it will apply. I guess only time will tell, and maybe we'll know in another 10 years. Anyway, below the ship, the crew notices a school of marrows all arriving on the scene and heading towards the sea god. Seeing this, Isma senses her calling and purpose and decides to join them in the fight. The legend spoke of the marrows defeating the sea god before, and now they have arrived to do it again. Roderick, being the motherfucking boss that he is, isn't just going to let the Marrows have to fight on their own. He orders his crew to head closer and blast the Sea God with cannon fire, even so much as to make the ship head towards the whirlpool that is now forming around the creature, but not before complimenting Farnese once more as her magical barrier is still in effect and so the Sea God cannot attack the ship with his tentacles. Underwater, Isma dodges the tentacles the best that she can, but is saved by a voice once more, shown to have come from her mother. She has returned along with the other Marrows and informs Isma that Marrows battle by singing. In other words, using powerful vocal projections that seem to hurt or weaken the Sea God. And it's a cool way to show the gentle nature of these astral creatures as their method of combat is inherently non-violent. However, inside the body of the Sea God, Guts is slashing his way through all of the worms and parasites within. The only issue is getting close enough to the heart. The size and power of the muscle and the vibrations of its beating sends pulses of sounds that not only push Guts away, but rattle his bones and cause even his ears to bleed out. His hearing, sight, and everything else is bombarded to the point where he can't even tell where he is in relation to the heart. And so, he is relying on Shirake to guide him. But even she realizes that despite the armor keeping him going, he still is taking a lot of physical damage. As Guts falls onto his back once again, he mentions his senses being so numb that he can't even feel his arms and legs. Guts' limitations of a human being when faced with the reality of a true godlike being. As much as he tries to power through, the obstacle is too great, at least for him on his own. From beneath the sea god, all of the marrows begin to sing in unison, causing the creature to try to rise itself out of the water. The vibrations of their voices all culminating together seem to cancel out the vibrations of the heartbeats. I don't think it's really meant to imply something like raising your positive vibrations to cancel out your negative ones, but it's kind of how I like to look at it. You can apply it to your own life, maybe. Anyway, with this development, this leaves Guts an opening. 
if only he could actually stand up and leave it to Guts' own Beast of Darkness to be the motivating factor in getting Guts back up on his feet. But within that, there is a lesson. The Beast of Darkness, Guts' shadow self, his own inner darkness, is something that can be channeled for positive purposes. Instead of letting the darkness take him over, he can direct that same energy into something useful. Now, this specific scene isn't exactly that, as the beast seems to be the one calling the shots here. However, it is a perfect example of things moving in the right direction. Here on his back and helpless is when you need that push of rage to get you moving again and back on your mission. These emotions within us, the ones that seem to just be there to drag us down, they can be used for good. We just have to understand them and understand ourselves. Guts standing to his feet, bleeding out, and showing that pure, honest-to-God willpower of the human spirit. That's what we want to see, goddammit. The Beast of Darkness was used to get him there, but the deeper meaning of it all is that we can push ourselves when we need it most. Reach deep down and stand back up. And with that, Guts raises the Dragon Slayer high above his head and slashes the shit out of the gigantic bastard's heart. The sea god roars and spits out blood and swallowed ships before beginning to collapse back into the water. Shurike's consciousness is then forced to return to her physical body, which is back on the ship. However, Guts is still inside the sea god as it begins to sink. Shurike too weak now and separated from Guts to return to him, and Farnese would try, but she must maintain her consciousness to maintain the protective spell around the ship. Even with the sea god dying, its blood draining into the water will attract more sea monsters to it, and so the barrier is needed. And so it falls to the Marrows once more, who agree to find Guts in thanks for the crew helping them out during the battle with the sea god. Guts at least is still unconscious, but he's being buried with blood and ocean water, in a darkness so black that he can't even tell where he is. It seems he would otherwise sink to his death, if he wasn't the main character, and once more, if weren't for the help from the astral form of the Moonlight Child who appears to help him. His astral body illuminates and begins to guide Guts in a direction. Outside the body of the Sea God, Captain Roderick jumps into the mouth of the creature with a lantern to hopefully look for Guts himself. That's right, Roderick goes himself. He doesn't just send a search crew. The man puts himself in danger for his crew. That's just the kind of guy he is. And there was no need for him to do this shirtless, but nobody's complaining about that. However, they don't get a chance to look long as the Sea God begins to sink even faster and they must retreat out of its mouth. The Moonlight Child guides Guts to an area that he can cut through, and as he does, Guts is seen and grabbed by dozens of marrows in a truly angelic looking image for the women bringing Guts from the darkness back up to the light. And of course, once again, only Guts will know that it was actually the Moonlight Boy who truly saved him. So some time passes and the Marrows agree to help guide the crew to Elfhelm themselves, a very cute and fantastical image of the warship surrounded by and guided by Marrows. It's pretty cool. Though Yzma transforms back into her human self, wanting to stay on board with the crew as she feels more comfortable with them. And after this point, Yzma kind of stagnates a bit as a character, but her abilities and connection to the Marrows serves as an important reminder in the newly changed world that the characters are now living in. Guts is laying in a lower deck of the ship, of course needing to be healed once more. The elves work their magic, as well as Shurike and Farnese. Shurike shows Farnese how to manipulate her ode to enhance Guts' healing. It's kind of like Reiki, I suppose. Farnese isn't healing Guts herself, but using her energy to enhance Guts' own healing. Along with being able to use the protection spell, Farnese has come so far and is satisfied with being able to help in all of these different ways, especially to Guts. Which is again put into perspective when Casca gets up from bed looking distressed. Guts immediately wants to stand up himself to go to her, causing Farnese to be reminded once more that despite all she can do to help, that Casca is still number one for Guts, and no amount of magic or protection spells is ever going to change that. Casca is distressed because the Moonlight Child is missing, and the crew begin to look for him with no avail, stating that if he fell overboard, at least one of the Marrow should have noticed. But Shurke recounts the full moon and how he disappeared last time as well. They are going off the assumption that he is some sort of astral being, 
but as of what, they don't know. The theory brought up by Shirke is that he could be an emissary of Elfhelm, checking on them before they arrive, seeing their intentions and if they could be a threat, which altogether is a decent theory, but we as the reader know more about the boy than the characters do at this point. We know the original body was swallowed by the egg, and that Griffith took it upon his arrival to the physical world. But hey, let's leave the vague possibility that perhaps there is another explanation. Mostly, I think it's just here to throw the characters off track of the truth, though. When Guts is laying in his bed, he notices that his hands are shaking, and that his eyes are having a hard time looking at the light. Remembering the words from Skull Knight about the armor, about how his senses will dull, and the more that he uses it, the more of an effect it will have on his body. Guts tries to ignore it, hanging on to the hope that they are almost at their destination, and that the journey will end there. That if he can just get to Elfhelm and heal Casca, it'll all be worth it. But the words that still linger from Skull Knight include that her wish may not be his wish. What is Guts' wish anyway? To be with Casca again, maybe? But what if she can't be with him? Flashes of the Eclipse, flashes of Griffith, the things that cause Guts rage, the birth of his endless trauma, his other wish, the one of vengeance, of killing Griffith. He wonders when his journey will really end. Will he continue that original wish once he gets to Elfhelm? His war declaration that he made long ago, is it still valid? Will his mind ever be able to let go of that original desire, the one born from his rage, hatred, and sadness? Casca, Griffith, what does Guts want? And I think this is all part of his struggle to try to figure that out. From there, Guts looks outside up at the moon, and despite his fluctuating vision problems, he thinks he sees something in front of it. To him, it will look like nothing, but in truth, he does see it. The Moonlight Child. His child, perhaps. Staring down at him from the sky, literally standing on what looks like an astral branch reaching across the sky. An item of some importance, but it will be explained later on. For now, we are left with the emotions of the child watching over its parents, and knowing that its time is short. For the full moon is almost over, and it must return from wherever it comes from for another month. The child enters the branch, and rides it like a wormhole or tunnel traveling very fast away from the ship. From a distance, it simply looks like a shooting star. A star that watches over our crew from above, as the marrows guide them from below. There's a lot of questions as to where Miura would go after the Sea God segment. Would Guts and the team continue to battle various sea monsters and demons on the way to the Elf Island? Would there be confliction and drama aboard the boat itself? Would Roderick and Farnese finally hook up in the captain's quarters? Well, sadly no. Or would the story shift focus back to Griffith and Falconia? This is probably the most separated that Guts and Griffith have ever been, and without some sort of massive detour in the script, they would have no reason to meet up again, at least not at this point. Instead, Miura does none of the above, and unexpectedly throws us back into the past giving us an image of Guts with things that we haven't seen in a long time. Him with both eyes and both arms. However, Miura did decide to keep his current drawing style and give young Guts a much more defined jawline than we've ever seen him have in the past. As much as you try to de-age your character, you can't get rid of that manly chin that you have developed since then. So Guts here is presented as a lone mercenary being captured by the enemy. He is clearly older than when we see him part Gambino's camp, so this mini-story within the Fantasia arc takes place technically in the Golden Age arc, within the four-year time skip of when Guts killed Gambino and ran away from his mercenary group, and before he wound up defeating the great Bazuzo and getting noticed by the Band of the Hawk and Griffith to begin with. So Guts is somewhere between 11 and 15 years old here. If I had to guess, I would put him very close to before he met the Hawks, nearing 15, just given his looks. Miura does a good job of making Guts look like a teen again, but he definitely doesn't look like a child. He's just too damn manly. Anyway, I'm going to assume this is one of his last adventures before finally meeting up with Griffith and the Band of the Hawk. But here Guts is captured, assumingly losing a battle that he was hired to participate in, and a line I really like in the translation is Guts talking about mercenaries and asking why God would care anything about them. And knowing what we do know about the Berserk lore and how all this negativity and violence and chaos within humans fuels the very idea of evil that is manipulating fate itself, it's pretty ironic. 
You would expect God to be a loving figure that would detest men like these, and yet the only idea of a godlike figure that we've seen has been born of and thrives upon the negativity that men like them create. Behind Guts is another merc, but one Guts seems not to know and who won't shut up. He also attempts to help Guts onto his feet, to which we are reminded of a time that Guts hated to be touched by anybody. A lingering sense of trauma left behind, no doubtedly, by Donovan, the one who molested him as a child and whom his only father figure allowed to have happen. And that's the thing we need to remember about this segment. We are dealing with a Guts that has had nobody worth trusting in his life, constantly hurt and betrayed, and assumingly for the last four years, a lone wanderer, distant and unable to connect with anyone or anything, long before his band of travelers on the boat, long before the band of the hawk, and before the love that he would feel for Casca. However, the man continues to try to aid Guts to his feet, and even gets the soldiers to back off a bit. At some point, Guts realizes that he is too wounded to continue to walk due to an arrow wound on his back, and agrees to lean on the old man. He continues to rattle on about the life of mercenaries and how they don't fight for any specific thing, but could potentially meet people worth fighting for. Words that come off seemingly wise, but none that Guts cares to hear about at this age. However, during this conversation, of which the man speaks his name of Martino, he picks the lock on Guts' wooden shackles. He then tells Guts to make a run for it, and that he can't reach his own locks, but he wants Guts to be free. After Guts agrees to repay him someday and books it down the edge of the cliff, the soldiers immediately notice and fire arrows after him, while Martino, who lied about his own shackles, slips free and uses the distraction of Guts to make his own getaway, proving once again to the young man that every time he puts a sliver of trust into someone, it is betrayed. Guts is as much a product of his own environment as anybody else. His guard is constantly up, and when put down, he is proven right that he should have had it up in the first place. The tragedy of Guts and of the world that he lives in is that there is never any guarantee that his wish will be their wish. This is why opening yourself up is so terrifying and why I find the juxtaposition of this in the Wounds chapters so beautiful. But Guts is still a few years away from that. Instead, he remembers the words of Gambino, that to survive on the battlefield, you can only rely on your own strength and your own wits. That the battlefield is just that, and that people will do horrible things just to survive. His words do not trust anyone. Which, to me, is not completely bad advice, especially if you relate the entire world and life itself as the battlefield. However, constant distrust and refusal to ever open up or release perpetuates a dark and distrustful world and creates more people just like Martino, just like Gambino, and just like the original Black Swordsman persona. How does the idea of evil thrive? And I'm not talking about a god of the Berserk universe, I just mean in general it's a snowball effect. Drowning yourself in that negative energy, depleting yourself, and depleting guts to the point where he doesn't even care whether or not he drops dead. Freezing cold and starving, and yet he still covers himself up. And he still bites into a rat just to keep himself alive. First of all, I'm really glad Guts didn't get the plague from this, but I guess it's still a few years too early for that. But also, just like every time Guts is on the verge of death, he struggles and continues to fight on, no matter what. As when he was a child bleeding out and surrounded by wolves, he could have given up and died, but he decided to raise his sword instead. That something within Guts, the human will to keep going, is there. To be strong is to keep fighting, and it may never be a fight that you win, and if you think about it, you won't. We are all going to die someday. But it's not about winning the fight. It's about fighting it. So long as there is breath in his body, he will continue to fight. To represent this feeling, upon the cold, dark, and uncaring floor beneath him sprouts a single flower. That single flickering hope within the darkness of reality. And as Guts lays on the ground, we see a little glowing figure right next to the flower watching Guts as he wakes up. The Vice Count that captured him and his guards come into the cell and inspect Guts and let him know that he will battle the Count's son and lose. As an attempt to give his son more confidence in battle. An example of rich nobles exploiting the weak and the poor. It's kind of like putting an animal in an enclosed area and giving someone a big-ass gun. Somehow this helps bolster someone's ego when really they couldn't be more pandered to. 
As a result, they decide to not feed Guts as they want him as weak as possible during the fight. So Guts collapses back on the ground, staring again at that single flower, and the little creature that appears behind it. Now, at this point in the story of Berserk, the astral and physical worlds are mostly completely separate, with only the occasional crossover, and I'm sure the full moon still would bring out a stronger connection. Guts' first time really seeing anything supernatural is in a few years when he would first come face to face with MOTHERFUCKING ZOD! <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in there. But again, that's still a ways away. And keeping consistent with the continuity, we can't have Guts comprehend anything supernatural that he would see in this flashback. But Miura does a good job in conveying Guts being so weak and tired to the point where the meeting between them feels more like a dream or like a hallucination on his part. The hallucination introduces herself as Chich, the spirit of the flower. And I think there's some confusion on whether or not Chich is an elf. There's an argument to be made just by her appearance, but she introduces herself as a spirit of the flower. As well, her life is attached to this very flower, which is something we've never seen from any other elf that we've encountered in the series. Also, her powers and abilities and how they work are very different from what we've seen from the other elves. Chich actually thanks Guts for eating the rat, since the rat was going to eat the flower, and if the flower were to die, so would she. Chich adorably speaks in third person and wants to repay Guts for unknowingly helping her. She isn't able to unlock the cell like he wants, but she is able to get water for him and use her ability to, much like the flower, absorb nutrients from the sun's rays and reflect it towards Guts, warming him and healing him. She is even able to take a leaf from her flower to apply to Guts' wounds, which help heal him as well. So even though it's a healing ability, it is much different from that of an elf's. But it is a reaffirmation to us that there are various positive astral beings that do exist, as humanity was blocked off to all of them, both the bad and the good. And like good and bad, Chich mentions the rise and fall of the sun, how the positive rays feel so good, but the darkness feels just as bad. To me, I think this symbolizes the fluctuation between the trust and betrayal for Guts. As good as the trust can feel, the darkness of betrayal feels equally bad, and both will continue to exist regardless of what you do. Chich is bound to her flower, unable to leave this world of alternating dark and light and the feelings associated with them. Her and Guts have much in common, and more in common than that is the eventuality that they will be alone once more, as Chich worries that Guts, like many others, will leave the cell and she will be by herself once more. Guts too has learned that often, and as we the readers know in the future, he will be alone again and again. Sensing this connection between them, Guts comically grabs a hold of Chich, squeezing her cheeks. And yes, I mean the ones on her face, you perverts. More uncertain on whether or not this is truly a hallucination. For Guts senses the commonalities between them, and though Guts isn't some great philosopher, he could still understand that this could be a manifestation of his insecurities. But taking the chance that Chich might be real, he tells her that he will take her flower to a field where there are many just like them, so she will be able to live outside the cell, outside of isolation. So happy about this news, Chich dances and continues to aid Guts' wounds, taking leaf after leaf over to his body to help him feel better. When Guts awakes the next morning, he feels stronger and healed, but Chich is nowhere to be found. Looking at the flower in the cell, it is now no more than a stem limped over. All the leaves have been removed. As Guts states picking it up, she didn't care about the consequences and tearing off all of her leaves to help somebody else. And think about this relating to Guts. Guts in the present timeline has consistently maimed and broken his own body to help someone else. More similarities between the two of them, Guts' body has many scars, and he is actively losing his senses with the continued use of the Berserker armor. At the expense of his own body, he has been trying to heal Casca. Casca showed him the way out of his own cell, as Guts was willing to do for Chich. And like Chich, Guts may wind up giving so much of himself that there is nothing left to give. Guts takes what remains of the flower and puts it in his pocket. 
Then Guts is brought into the battle arena. He has given his armor back, and it's kind of cool to see his old helmet back again in the manga, but he's also handed a tattered sword that can barely cut, while the Vice Count's son is of course decked out head to toe in heavy armor in fighting with a huge mace. Thanks to Chich, Guts is healed enough to keep his wits about him, but he's still not up to full strength, and of course there's the issue of what he has to work with. But remembering advice from Gambino on the battlefield, Guts opts to use his sword not to swing, but as an item of pressure to grapple the sun to the ground, and then in classic Guts fashion, he swings the hill into the sun's eye like an axe. Guts takes the rich boy hostage, and everyone begins to draw their weapons and point their arrows at him. As Guts grapples with the boy, the chitch flower flies out of his possession. Guts instinctively reaches out to retrieve it, and that very action is which causes Guts to narrowly miss getting hit by a couple of arrows. The funny part is the sun is the one that gets hit, but this could have been a power of Chich, still existing within the flower, and still helping, still continuing to aid even after all the leaves have fallen off. Or it could have been mere coincidence. After that, chaos ensues, as the arena falls under an arrow assault themselves. Breaking into the arena are a group of mercenaries led by Martino. He and Guts recognize each other, and make no mistake, Martino is not here to save Guts. He had no idea whether Guts would be alive or not. He's here to continue whatever job that he was paid for to attack and siege this castle. Saving Guts is something he considers to be a happy accident. But Guts completely ignores him, instead searching for the flower that escaped his grasp. He finds it on the ground, stepped on and broken completely. And yet, despite Chich not being here to communicate, despite the flower losing all of its leaves and being bent and broken, despite not knowing if Chich was even real or not, Guts still travels with the flower, alone, to the field of flowers he had promised to bring her to. He waits perhaps trying to find some glimpse of her, to hope that the spirit is still with him somehow, but she doesn't arrive. Even so, Guts lets the flower go, to be one with the rest of them, staring into the sky, wondering if Chich was real, or truly a hallucination. But I think Guts recognized the similarities between them. Even if she wasn't real, Guts had to bring her here, and let her be at peace. Maybe if he could do that, then that means that someday he could be at peace as well. Maybe there's a field of flowers for him. And maybe there's a place that even when the sun sets on him once more, he will be surrounded by love and care of others like him. Maybe if Guts continues to struggle and continues to move into that sunlight, even if the darkness is so much stronger, and maybe even if he loses all of his leaves in the process, that it will still be okay. And the one he wanted to help will be able to continue to walk as well. I'll return to our main characters, still on the boat. Okay, so not much is happening there. I mean, even Thorfinn saw some sea monsters on his journey. Well, thought he did anyway. Or at least talked about the idea of the world being round. Well, at the very least, the Berserk cast isn't as stuck as those guys over on the Black Whale. How, how are you guys doing? You got any of those new chapters? No? Tagashi? Boat arcs, I tell you, man. So since this isn't going anywhere, how about we zip on over to the mainland to see what's happening there? This is actually a perfect opportunity in the story to take a break from Guts and crew and to continue the world building. Yes, we have an awareness that ever since Ganishka's death, the entire world has merged with the astral world, but what is the full extent of this? The Sea God showed us that ancient beings are awakening, that monsters have by and large been unleashed upon the unsuspecting world, a world that has painstakingly spent the last 1000 years specifically being conditioned to forget about such magics. Humanity's ties to that of magic and the fantastical world was at an all-time low, causing an all-time high of fear when it came to thinking about such things. And as fear manifests, so do the creatures we fear. To be honest, one of my favorite aspects about Berserk was the slow build of the medieval story into a full-on fantasy. We start in a grounded, understandable world in the Golden Age arc. Fictional, yes. But if you have a general awareness of Europe and medieval times, you can at least understand the concepts that were at play. And we slowly usher in more and more of the fantastical concepts as time goes on. 
little bit of demons here, elves there, some trolls, and then a full-on magical spells and barriers and giant sea monsters. I spoke at one point that there's a portion of the fan base that dropped out or lost interest of the series once it delved into the more fantastical and magical elements. I'm not going to sit here and say that they're stupid or that they don't understand the complexities of this brilliant literature masterpiece. It's just a matter of taste and preference. But what works for me was the gradual incorporation of these elements. It's not thrown at you all at once. It was 34 volumes before the world was overrun with mythological creatures, and now at the tail end of volume 37, we are actually experiencing what life is like as a consequence of this. And what does it look like? It looks like a giant cock. But wait, before we get to that, some carriages are being chased through the forest by a horde of trolls, and we all know how bad they can be. From the back of the carriage, a character sets up a crossbow mechanism very similar to the one we've seen on Guts' arm. And there in the carriage, we are reintroduced to my boy, Rickert. Rickert, the youngest member of the former Band of the Hawk who has literally not been seen since chapter 182. This is currently chapter 332. That is 150 chapters without this character. Rickert, though being a member of the Band of the Hawk, was not present during the Eclipse. He is unbranded and free from the sacrifice. He then became a bit of a pupil for the blacksmith Godo, becoming quite the craftsman himself, making Gus's crossbow and arm cannon, as well as single-handedly making the graves for all of the fallen Band of the Hawk members, but I'll get to that a bit later. The important thing to remember about Ricker is that he went years without knowing what really happened to the Hawks. It wasn't until Griffith showed up at the Hill of Swords that he witnessed Guts's rage towards him. After the battle and when Griffith chose to depart, Guts finally told Ricker the truth, just how much that he didn't know. He might have left out the details about Casca, I'm not sure, but Griffith's choice in the sacrifice, the God Hand, and the Apostle Massacre was all revealed to him, making Ricker one of the only characters that knows what happened on that fateful day. Puck was there too, as Guts explained, filling in the gaps of what he had already sensed, but all of Guts's current crew know nothing about his relation to Griffith or the horrors of the Eclipse. Rickert stands alone in this role, and why the separation between Guts and Rickert? Why is he not with the current boat crew? Well, you have to remember at the time that Rickert and Guts split up, Guts still wanted to take his journey alone. He knew that both he and Casca were branded and that the nightly visits from demons and spirits, it wouldn't be safe for Rickert and mostly wouldn't be safe for Erica, which is Godo's adopted granddaughter, who is traveling with Ricker and has no fighting skills and would need to be just as protected as Casca. So Guts wasn't ready to accept others into his journey. But most importantly, Guts didn't believe Ricker could go against Griffith the way that he had. Once again, Ricker wasn't there. He could hear the story, he can believe the story, but he didn't witness it. He didn't have to watch the ones that he cared about be torn apart or eaten or even worse. There's an innocence to Rickert that he has not gone through the traumatizing experience the way that Guts did. Now, yes, I know Rickert did see some members die at the hands of the Count and Rosine, but the extent of walking up to the end of a massacre and being smack dab in the middle of one while trapped in a hell dimension is still quite different. Also, I imagine Guts wanted Rickert to hold on to that innocence or what was left of it. He didn't want to force Ricker to join him in this world of darkness and vengeance, and it's why he went alone the first time, and why he didn't bring Ricker the second time. So Ricker was left to travel alone with Erica to try to find some place safe for them to live. And it looks like that has not been achieved, because right now there is a giant cock looking at them. Hacker! This is a cockatrice, and I'll talk about that in a monster manual someday. Just know that it's a bit of a dick. It's then when Ricker and Erica notice a group of human soldiers emerge to rescue them. Soldiers with flags that Ricker immediately recognizes. Almost identical to the former Band of the Hawk banners that he once flew by his side. The big cock seems to be a little bit too much for them to take, and that's when Irvine steps up to the plate. In one of the coolest Apostle transformations, he holds out his bow, and with the powerful aura surrounding him, he transforms into his full demon form, plucking a hair from his tail to use as an arrow and using the antlers in front of him like a bow. Now, I won't make any jokes about this being a dick measuring contest between a big cock and this, but I'm sure someone in the comments can post a good one and I'll pin it to the top. Irvine's arrow now stabs into the cockatrice's mouth and then explodes needles outwards and takes the creature down. And then there was much rejoicing. 
all except for Ricker, one who knows what an apostle is and wonders why on earth there is one here working with humans, protecting and saving them. Rickert was aware that Griffith had rebuilt the Band of the Hawk and that they were defending Midland against the Kushans, but now he sees the extent of what that means. The apostles, the things that killed everyone that he cared about, are now working for Griffith, the man that he once looked up to the most. Laban is also here with his group of soldiers, and Rickert recognizes him and shows him the old Band of the Hawk crest that he keeps with him. Laban may not specifically remember him, but he remembers that version of the Band of the Hawk that won the Hundred Years' War all those years ago. And Laban graciously wishes to escort Rickert and the others back to Falconia, the only place conceivably safe from the monsters running rampant on the world. On the way back, we see the landscape of how giant crystals protrude from the ground surrounding the kingdom, surging with powerful energy that supposedly ward off evil creatures. I'm not sure how I feel about the validity of that. It may be that the powerful energy radiating does dissuade them, or it could just be for show and is actually the power of a god hand that they sense that keeps them at bay. The biggest deal, though, is the World Spiral Tree. What was once Ganeshka's Shiva form is now locked in place and illuminating white. I think of this like a giant power source connecting both of the worlds, the physical and the astral. A battery, if you will. Even the two legs twisting around each other kind of symbolizes the merging of two worlds. And his arms are now turned into the spiral tree branches, which literally branch from the top of the tree and across the entire sky. Like tunnels or a highway for fast travel. But of course, not just anybody could use them for travel. But we have witnessed one character do it so far the Moonlight Boy, which explains his disappearance. And there's more specifics about who can use these branches for travel and what this tree is all about, but for now it's kind of left as a tease for what's to come. We are being introduced to how the new world works though through the eyes of a character that, like the audience, knows the truth. It's great because we are seeing things explained to Ricker through people that are happy and excited about their savior and how they believe the city is a sanctuary and how they think the tree causes their harvest to last year round and how gracious Falconia is to take in all of the refugees. We see the amazement and we understand why people would be happy about this, but because it's Ricker being introduced to this, we feel that uneasiness because we know that he's not going along with the entire idea, but is keeping his mouth shut in order to understand what is going on. It's good writing and a good use of the character. Also, the pure vastness of Falconia is pretty incredible. This is the first time we are truly seeing it in the manga, and Miura just does his work to show how gigantic this place really is. The architecture, the inhabitants, and, and just everything. I can't imagine how long it took to draw all of these buildings and all of these people. Laban drops Ricker and Erica off at an office where they can become registered as citizens of Falconia, but not before handing Ricker two important pieces of paper. A letter of recommendation for our blacksmith duties, and a letter to get him into the castle for an audience with Griffith himself. Knowing that he is a former Band of the Hawk member, Laban only thinks it's natural that he should reunite with his leader, unaware of anything suspect. Rickert takes the paper, but unsure of what he should actually do. I mean, imagine being dropped into this, seeing the world of peace, safety, and unity, with even Kushan and Midlanders living in harmony together, and knowing it all came about due to the deaths and betrayal of all your friends. But then, holy shit, it's Luca! The person in charge of setting up lodging in this area of Falconia so happens to be the prostitute with a heart of gold from the Conviction Arc. She even has a group of girls with her. Well, minus Nina, thank God. Let's just hope Joaquin finally kicked her ass to the curb somewhere, if they both aren't already dead. But this is great. Berserk has had a lot of amazing side characters, and the unfortunate thing is, many of them we never see again. Rickert was kind of a main character, but let's be honest, he was much more of a supporting role back in the day. Luca was a huge part of the Conviction arc and everything that happened at the Tower of Conviction. She harbored and took care of Casca, helped Guts infiltrate the Tower, and was courted by my man Jerome. Wait a second. Where the hell is Jerome? They broke up. It's mentioned somewhere, but I'm still not over it. Look, I know Jerome was a bit of a simp, but he was still a total badass, alright? He killed two pseudo-apostles with one sword swing. I'll never forget about that. He even quit his job in the Holy Iron Chain Knights to help Luca rescue her friends. And now he's nowhere to be seen? Okay, so maybe he was cheating on his wife with a prostitute, and maybe he wasn't the smartest tool in the shed, but man, 
I miss that son of a bitch. But at least we have Luca back. And having her cross paths with Ricker is a really fun idea as they both share an experience with Guts but know nothing about one another. But she isn't the only character we know brought back in. Daiba is here too. Miura really is merging all these different worlds and eras together. If you think about it, we have Rickert from the Golden Age, Luca from Conviction, and Daiba from Millennium Empire all meshed together here in the Fantasia arc. Now if we could just pull somebody from the Black Swordsman arc in too. Where's Theresa at anyway? She's still gotta kill Guts, right? Anyway, Daiba is working in the stables keeping a low profile and only subtly using his magic to help calm the horses. And again, Rickert has no clue who this old man is, no awareness that he likes to float in the air smoking some hookah while summoning giant water snakes. The next day, Rickert begins his trek towards the soon-to-be-crowned King Griffith. To say the structures leading to him are massive would be an understatement. We are talking about multiple Titanic level huge here. And all that's running through Rickert's mind right now is how things used to be. The original Midland Capital Castle no longer exists. All these structures built over the ashes of what once was. He meets with Owen, whom Rickert also recognizes from back in those humble days. And this next part is really interesting as Owen takes Ricker into an area where dozens of people are mourning the death of loved ones, surrounded by holy imagery, priests, and even the pontiff himself. What is happening is a mass funeral for those that did not make it to Falconia before being killed. And this becomes a transcendent moment as before their eyes, Griffith himself arrives and performs one of his miracles, showcasing his divine authority. Griffith brings out the souls of the dead, and allows them to say goodbye to their loved ones before passing on, even using Sonya, his medium, to translate any lost communication between them. Now, we've seen Griffith do something similar to this before on a smaller scale, and there are some theories that it's all an illusion, that Griffith isn't actually bringing out the literal souls of the dead, but I believe he is. My personal theory, and remember, much of these videos are just my interpretation of the story and not meant to be taken as 100% fact. But what could the purpose of Griffith holding these gigantic funerals to give people closure be? It's not like he has to do them. He's a busy guy running a gigantic kingdom, so what's the benefit here? So I hold on to the theory that the Holy See religion was part of the plan of fate and causality brought by the God Hand or the idea of evil. And I think it kind of goes like this. Step one is disconnecting humanity from the world of the spiritual and positive beings like the elemental kings, elves, and whatever else. That leads into step two, which is to create an organized religion that gives people only one way to think and one way to view spirituality, and failure to follow and disobeying results in brutal torture or burning. Step three would be to plunge the world into chaos with plague and war. Step four would be bringing about a prophesized Christ-like figure that everyone would latch onto and follow towards salvation. And step five is that savior gives you not only proof of life after death, but also puts you at peace with the idea. It'll subtly eliminate the fear of death to not have to just have faith, but to know for a fact that your soul will live on. This will persuade people to be more accepting and comforting of death as a whole. Do not fear for when you die, you will be whisked off to paradise. Put this on a large enough scale when the eventual idea is presented you will have an entire gigantic city of people that all collectively believe the same thing, that dying is okay and that they will accept their death. There's no need to fight against it. There's no need to struggle. And when a mass collection of thought is brought about combined with the desire to end their human suffering and to go to a land of peace, this is when I believe the final step will take place. Step six, assimilate all life into one mass collection of energy the abyss. Humanity's purpose will be fulfilled by all of them being unified in a collective mass where individuality is destroyed and they will finally end and fulfill all of humanity's desires. It won't be a sacrifice like the other ones. It will be a mass self-sacrifice. I believe they will give themselves over willingly without knowing the extent of the cost. But hey, that's just my little theory for now. I could change my mind in a week. But I think that we can agree that this is very much a part of the plan and very much a part to push as much of humanity into a particular direction and mindset as possible, swaying them little by little, like a devil whispering in your ear, but instead it's a god showing them the light. And to a point where no one can defy his authority. As Locust states walking up to Rickert, this is the divine right of kings, meaning an authority from God that you cannot deny or defy. 
Locus, being aware of Rickard's former relation to the human form of Griffith, wishes to show him something about the current God Hand version. Rickard agrees to go with him, and they head out back of the castle to an area conveniently separated from the front of the city, a place where no human can see, a long bridge leading to a giant black sphere shrouded in darkness. And thankfully, it's not a Gantt sphere. But back in the city, Erica is still hanging around the stables, to which there is a rumor that Daiba keeps a monster in one of them. But of course, he won't let anybody in to see it. Erica does notice, though, Daiba's weak legs, and retrieves a brace from the carriage that they came in. A great little moment to remind us of how Godo's craftsmanship was taught to and progressed by Rickert. And she also mentions that her grandfather Godo made a massive sword. And both Luca and Daiba have this great moment where they recall Guts, but of course, neither of them knows that the other is thinking the same thing. It's a great little moment. Back inside the sphere, which is actually a coliseum, is a mass collection of apostles that sit in the stands and watch one apostle battle with an ogre. And yeah, apparently this apostle has a name, and it's fucking Borkov. And this is in fact meant to be the same apostle that consumed Guts' arm during the eclipse. Mirror decided to bring him back and give him a name. I can only hope this is to set up Guts ripping this dude in half someday. But anyway, Ricker is of course mortified at watching this. He's seen an apostle before, but nothing on this level. And as Locus explains, it is because of Griffith that monsters like this and himself have a purpose other than to mindlessly indulge. Locus wants Ricker to realize that whatever sacrifice Griffith made to get to this point justifies the reality of the people at peace, of humanity fighting as one, of demons used as soldiers. Something has been achieved unlike that which has ever been seen before. After the funeral session, Griffith and his closest allies relax in a beautiful garden area. Charlotte is here doing her best to please everybody, bringing them tea and sweets. The pontiff is here as well at the table alongside Sonia and Mule, while Sonia continues her subtly snarky comments towards Charlotte, still jealous of Charlotte's relationship with Griffith. As well, the pontiff mentions that he has yet to marry them and crown Griffith as the king. Even though everybody seems to see him as the king already, the ceremony has not taken place yet. And I can only imagine that perhaps this is because that event will be used as a massive plot point in the upcoming story, maybe for what I was talking about earlier. A good way to gather everybody together, I suppose. But I am shocked that it wouldn't be one of the first things that needed to happen considering how the world of mankind is set up. But I'm also glad it wasn't skipped because I feel like it's something that we need to witness. And at last, Rickert is brought forth for his audience. He got what he wanted, and now if Rickert wants to join him still, all the better. The past is done. And so what will it be, Rickert? And Rickert says, nothing. Rickert pimp slaps the shit out of Griffith's stupid face harder than a can of twisted tea. You just got slapped, bitch. <laughs> Is this feeling that's put you in your place a hot red burning on the side of your face i just got slapped across the face my friend the slap that echoes through eternity and I think it's a testament to the story of berserk that just a single slap hypes the fandom up so much that we as the audience want Karma to catch up with Griffith so bad that even the smallest hit makes us scream with joy. Imagine how we're going to react when real damage is done to Griffith. But regardless, there is a bit of controversy here about how or why Rickert was able to smack Griffith. First of all, there's the fact that Griffith should be fast and strong enough to block or evade this if he wanted to. And we also have it stated towards the beginning of the Millennium Empire arc that things from this world of man can't seem to touch or harm him in any way. There was a time where he was attacked with dozens of arrows and they all seemed to miraculously miss him. There could be several explanations for the slap being so effective. It could be that Griffith just let it happen, knowing that it wouldn't really hurt him, also allowing Rickard to have that tiny bit of catharsis. Giving the people what they want is what he does after all, so why not? Does Griffith feel any remorse? No, he doesn't. But what harm to the overall objective would there be to get bitch slapped a little bit? None, really. Why start a confrontation? Just let it happen and move on. But there's also the more spiritual theory that Rickert had such a solid conviction within his heart that he was able to follow through with smacking a god hand. That absolute belief that Griffith deserved it, and so it happened. 
just as Guts' own belief in his ability to cut down apostles helps enhance his sword, and how Shirake and Farnese give themselves willingly to the astral world of magic, a complete alignment of intention with no restraints. But whatever the reason is for it, the important thing is that it happened. It showed that Griffith can be hit, and it showed that his thrall of a god hand does not work on everybody. Unlike Mule, who was brought to his knees upon first meeting Griffith, Rickert stands tall, rejecting this false idol. Rickert shows Griffith the Band of the Hawk crest, and notes how the design is slightly different than the current one. How it was Rickert himself who made the graves for the Band of the Hawk, the one who mourned them. The responsibility fell on him. He did what this Griffith could not, and he tells him that his leader was Griffith the White Hawk, the human who built a mercenary team from the ground up, not the Hawk of Light. Not this divine being thriving from the sacrifice of others with no guilt. As Griffith stated before, his heart was frozen during his transformation. All that remains is the idea of Griffith. Just the ambition and a dream inside of a Griffith suit. This is not the man of whom Rickert respected. And because of this, Rickert turns his back on him, saying goodbye and prepared to leave this sanctuary for good. Rickert... The character lost to so many chapters has one of the most triumphant returns I have ever seen from any character. Oh, Rickert, youngest member of the original Band of the Hawk, fought side by side with many great warriors, including Guts the Hundred Man Slayer and Corcus the Chad, witnessed dozens of his comrades eaten by apostles, caretaker of Guts and Casca, the only survivors of the Eclipse learned the craft of blacksmithing from Godo, and managed to keep Erica safe from monsters when the physical and astral worlds unleashed horror upon the Earth. Granted access into Falconia, and given an audience with its soon-to-be king, Lord Griffith, the White Hawk, no, the Hawk of Light. The one who has shown humanity that divinity is real, and that he is its personification. Rescuing them from the dangers of the outside world, defeating the vicious warlord Ganeshka, and easing their anxieties about the afterlife, showing them the souls of the dead one last time before they pass on. A symbol and a beacon of hope, light, and destiny. And Rickert smacked that stupid fuck right in his face. We can say with certainty at this point in the story that Rickert's palm has done more damage against Griffith than Guts' Dragon Slayer and his entire crew combined. I think about how people are won over by the incredible presence of Griffith, the one that he has naturally as a divine being, how Mule bowed and pledged his loyalty to him as if he were being compelled by some greater force. That Rickert, though respecting the man that Griffith was, was able to stay true to his convictions and understanding about Griffith's betrayal and deliver a much-deserved strike to his stupid face. The thing about a slap, too, specifically, as opposed to, like, a punch, is that it's more of an insulting gesture than it is about power or violence. It also shows to me, at least, a theory that if people knew about what Griffith was or what he did to achieve this power, they would perhaps be able to repel their infatuation with him. He's followed because he gives everybody the reasons to follow him, both in the world of man and in the world of biblical prophecies. Rickert knows he can't defeat Griffith in combat or take away his empire, but he can reject him. And it shows the absolute testicular fortitude that Rickert would rather rough it in a world filled with monsters than live in peace under the rule of a man that betrayed and murdered his friends. That is a testament to a true warrior, and why I fucking love Rickert. On the Griffith side of things, he just smiles as Rickert walks away. The fate of Rickert isn't really something that would be of importance to him, and he probably just found it amusing that finally someone was able to reject him. And this may just be wishful thinking on my part, but maybe somewhere inside him, he was mildly proud at what a strong person Rickert had become. After all, Griffith's talk by the Fountain in the Golden Age arc mentioned that he respects one with their own mission and purpose, even if it opposes his own. Wishful thinking, I know, However, Locus is not too happy about watching his king be disrespected like that. When Rickert returns to where he and Erica are staying, he uses his craftsman skills to help some people out, even constructing a working water hose that would put out fires. Commenting on the technology of the city, we learn that they have working water, sewers, toilets, the whole shebang. 
It would appear that things are good enough for people to become extremely comfortable here, perhaps shifting humanity's mindset in a more particular and contented direction. Some of Luca's workers try hitting on Rickert, knowing his skills and connection to Lord Griffith, but Rickert is a motherfucking G and gives them no attention back. It's between a conversation of Rickert and Luca that he mentions that he actually slapped Griffith in his face, and now he wants to leave the city. Of course, this would put both he and Erica in mortal danger, but Erica is a ride-or-die kind of girl, and decides that she will stay with Rickert no matter what the circumstances. Now, right now, it's a little unclear as to what direction the Rickert-Erica thing is going to go. Yes, I know she's a child here, but Rickert isn't technically that much older than her, and I'm not saying right now, but given the fact that Berserk might have a time skip in the near future, there's possible building blocks here for when they mature. Very specifically, when they mature. Or they might just continue to have this sort of brother-sister dynamic. I guess my only real point is, is it kind of shows a parallel to Guts and Casca in that Rickert has somebody important to him that he wants to protect and defend. Rickert takes a walk to ponder and reflect on his life, as we all should from time to time, I would recommend it. He notices how all the blacksmith and craftsmen here are working hard in the Empire, and they seem to all have this purpose and drive within them. And after everything, this place might be a good thing for humanity at large. But Rickert knows it was built upon graves, and the true demonic nature of the Apostles. There's confliction, I believe, but not enough to waver his heart. Honestly, Rickert has more understanding of what he values than Guts had during the bulk of his journey. But also, granted, Rickert wasn't physically at the Eclipse, which makes a huge difference. In a way, Rickert benefited the most from everything that would happen. But as he looks into the distance, and the sun sets, a shadow looms over him, one in the form of the Apostle Roxas. A member of the new Band of the Hawk that we know the least about, and who claimed that even he wished to kill Griffith, but would serve him for now. Ironically, he was once a Kushan, just as Ganeshka was, and he moves quickly to attack Rickert, but is warded off by the flying blades of Salat. Well, him and his Bakiraka bodybuilders, as I call him. I did a video on Salat and his character development if you guys want to check it out, but he's one of those characters that have always been with us, but has acted more of an observer than anything else. Watching each stage of the world of Berserk change and gathering information as it goes forward. He's a character I often feel bad for, and he seems to be constantly upstaged. But in his presentation here, he seems particularly confident. Another thing I like about this segment, and I mean the entire Rickert adventure segment to begin with, is that you have all these characters that have met Guts before. You have Rickert, Salah, Luca, Daiba, but none of them have really met or interacted with each other. It's fun for us as the audience to piece all of their individual stories together to make up one in the whole universe of Berserk. But if Salat doesn't know Rickert, why is he here to save him? The sneaky bastard that he is witnessed the Slaptasia event and Rickert walking away from Griffith, thus assuming that this boy must know something that the others do not. Some kind of secret of Griffith, for which Rickert actually does know. So defending him from Raxus seems to only be a happy accident, as he had his own intentions upon meeting up with Rickert. As for Raxus here, he is a bit of a mystery. Was he sent on an assassination mission, and by Griffith, or maybe by Locus? Locus would make more sense, as Griffith seemed to be simply just amused by his rejection, and once again, there would be no purpose in killing Rickert. Even if Rickert ran the streets of Falconia trying to tell everybody that Griffith is a demon lord, who would believe him? It makes no tactical sense to kill him when he's just going to leave the city of his own accord anyway. From my deduction, that either leaves Locus sending him after being pissed, or this is Raxus's own decision, perhaps viewing Ricker as an obstacle. If he wants to try to kill Griffith himself someday, he can't have somebody else hogging the glory. The battle commences and we actually get to see the Bakiraki bodybuilders do some work, and they're not half bad. Raxus is a very unique apostle, as he doesn't really seem to have a human form and apostle form. He's just constantly like a moving black cloak that can expand and retract and become various shapes. He's like the Mr. Fantastic of the Berserk universe. I don't even like the Fantastic Four, that's just an easy way to think about it. But maybe he's actually more like Elder Tagoro from Yu Yu Hakusho, if you've seen that series. As Salat attacks and breaks Raxus' mask, he mentions that might not be where his head is. So likely, just like Elder Tagoro, he can move his vitals around in his body wherever he wants, which would make it extremely difficult to land a deciding blow. Raxus gets rather upset about his mask being broken. At this rate, he could get COVID any second, so obviously he has to go find another mask. Salat being the badass rebel he is, pulls his mask down to speak. Also, Rickert does vaguely remember him from his second encounter with Guts. I almost forgot Rickert was actually there for that. 
and yes, Lot wants to know all the juicy details about Griffith. Ricker agrees to tell him, but with a proposition. We then cut to Ricker bringing the Kushan soldiers back, having them hidden in some robes, which reminds me of some D&D level shit when you're playing a half-orc that needs to blend in with the town folk. It's pretty funny. They even get mistaken for orcs by Luca and Erica. Poor bodybuilders. Nobody is used to seeing that much jack testosterone fueled muscle in Falconia. These people should hit the gym more often. Daiba does recognize what they are and offers for them to hide inside of his stables. It's there that Ricker, Salat, Luca, and the others decide what they should do as Raxus could be back any moment. Salat mentions a hidden village that the Kushan belonged to before invading other parts of the world. During his monologue, there is an image of a mountain, so I'm wondering if it's on a mountain top or just hidden within the mountains. He mentions it being difficult for outsiders to get to, and assumes it's still safe even with the world overrun with creatures, so that says something about its seclusion. When it comes to wondering if Griffith sent the assassin, Rickert believes it's possible, as it would be in the category of his hidden side that he didn't show very many people back when he was human, the side that had the queen and her counterparts burned alive once upon a time. And Luca, being the nurturing figure that she is, tells the girls to help gather provisions and wishes Rickert nothing but encouragement on his upcoming journey. Later that night, Raxus returns as promised, sporting a brand new high-quality mask that's instantly damaged by Rickert's repeating crossbow that he had constructed. They were ready for him and waiting for Raxus' ambush. Maybe he shouldn't have told them he'd be back. Salat jumps into the attack using an assortment of his Kushan assassin weaponry, including the whip-like blades that we saw him fight against Guts in the Golden Age, and even a blade that he holds between his toes. That's pretty sick. And it seems as though by watching the movement within the cloak-like body of Raxus, Salat was able to pinpoint his head and actually manage to cut it, which is the closest thing that we've had to inflicting any real injury on one that can contort his body in any way that he sees fit. The admission from Salat that it was his duel with Guts that sparked the change in how he holds back his ego is also a nice touch. And we also get the payoff to the setup of the fire hose, instead this time filling it with oil and using it as a goddamn flamethrower. Hell yeah, that's awesome. Raxus bursts into flames, but again expands his cloak-like body above the flames. Half of him is on fire, and yet he's still attacking, the fire not seeming to hurt him at all, which makes me assume that it could be the only real part of him is his head that he can place anywhere on his body. Kind of like an amoeba, and he doesn't really feel much pain from the sensations in his body. If it can grow, expand, and regenerate at will, that kind of makes sense. It's like an extension of himself, but not the core. It would be like fighting Lord Zed's putties. It doesn't matter where you hit them, you have to hit them on the Z. But in this case, the Z moves around wherever it wants to. I hope you guys got that reference. Anyway, to put out the flames all over him, Raxus picks up a fucking horse and rips it in half to douse the flames with the blood. People that say Miura has lost his touch are going crazy. Also, this is around the time that Miura switched from drawing on paper to drawing digitally. As some people hate this switch, some like it, some don't really even notice a difference. Although I think Conviction and Millennium Empire have the best art in the series overall, I think the new style is just fine. It's still Miura after all. Raxus then picks up Erica, and I remember reading this for the first time, and I was legitimately scared that Miura might actually go there and have her killed. It's been a while since a character has bit the dust, but nope, she is saved. Not by Ricker, not by Salat, but by a bunch of snakes. Oh, oh wait, snakes that are controlled by Daiba? This old kook sits floating in the air like the badass that he is, showing off just why he was Ganishka's general and head sorcerer. Just as he had influenced in corrupting the animals' minds with the evil energy making Pashakas, he similarly is able to control the animals nearby, such as snakes and rats, to attack Raxus. Also, why he was perfect for caretaking the stables of horses, because he could calm them down. Again, I think it's so great that all these different people interconnected by Guts and Griffith's story all converge here to interact and fight as one. It's kind of how I see the story moving forward towards its conclusion as well. Anyway, Daiba unleashes his, uh... Guayadas, I don't know how to pronounce it, giant pterodactyl creatures, that's what it is. And he was hiding them in his stables all along, I, somehow. And the entire crew jump on their backs and try to make their escape while Raxus is fending off all of the snakes and rats. Erica and Ricker give Luca a warm and thankful goodbye, as well as leaving her some diamonds for compensation. After that, the group is off the ground, but Raxus stretches himself far into the air as far as he can to chase after them. And then, you guys, and then... Motherfucking Ricker, the Chad swordsman that smacked Griffith in his stupid face, pulls out another one of his contraptions, 
a fucking makeshift bazooka, rocket launcher, whatever it is, cannon, and he fires it into Raxus, causing an explosion of flame. What's that do? It is absolutely inconceivable what a complete badass record is. Now, what would be really cool is if this ragtag group of misfits actually managed to kill Raxus, but just like my hopes with Grunbeld back in the Millennium Empire arc, I don't think that happens. I can't imagine the bazooka slash rocket launcher thing having a ton more force than Guts' arm cannon, which can seriously wound an apostle, but I don't know. It does look like it's shown that he aims past the mask, perhaps to Raxus' actual head, if he is alive, I really hope Miura has a special plan for him and for all of the live to fight another day scenarios. I want to see a body count start stacking up again, man. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's with the villains or with the heroes. But what do you guys think? Is Raxus coming back or is this it for him? Now with Rickard, I think this weapon is just perfect enough as something that he could create. It's not too far over the top and it falls in line with the arm cannon that he's made before. But now I'm just thinking about the possible combinations of Rickert's exceptional craftsmanship combined with the unique weaponry of Salat and the Bakiraka. What kind of crazy steampunky badass shit could these two come up with combining their skills? Not to mention adding Daiba's magic into that as well. Holy crap, the possibilities, man. And not to get too far ahead, the possibility of a time skip means that we could see an older teen or adult Rickert decked out in Kushan weaponry mixed with his own designs. I and seeing something like that just might be, might be more manly than Roderick himself. It's crazy, I know. Lucas sees the warriors off and they use the giant birds to fly over the walls of Falconia towards the hidden Kushan village. And watching them from afar, Griffith sees the escape across the sky. Before Griffith saw one person reject him, but leaving Falconia now is Rickert with five other people. In a short time, one turned into more. Maybe this was the prompting for the assassination. Then again, he could kill them easily enough and without being seen, but he still lets them go. They're not a threat, right? Well, that's the question. Also, real quick, it definitely looks like the full moon is here, and yet if we are assuming Griffith and the Moonlight Boys share a body, he's not transforming and is looking directly at it. But there could also be multiple explanations for this. Moon phases are tricky, and maybe the boy only takes over one of the three nights of the full moon, the middle and most powerful night. This is what I think is most likely the case, backed up by a scene that we'll see in the near future, but in any case, the Rickert segment draws to a close with his escape from the paradise of Falconia and gaining some unlikely allies. And to wrap it all up, I love this segment of the story. I like taking a break from the main cast for a little while and seeing what's going on in the rest of the world. I love bringing back minor characters that we haven't seen in a long time like Luca. I like showing Rickert's development and devotion to his word. And of course, I love seeing Salat have more relevance to the story, stepping up and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an apostle. And I mean that literally, he uses his toes. Seeing the cityscape and how everything works is great, and seeing how people by and large are living peaceful and unified lives, it's something that's too good to be true, because, well, it is. Because behind the veil of unification are the bloody graves of others and a vicious and manipulative intent that is yet to be fully realized. I have my own theories, but mostly I believe Falconia is about channeling a collective consciousness into being okay with the eventual final outcome of the God Hand. All these people are up for the slaughter, and they'll walk into it willingly. But of course, that's just my theory. A berserk theory! Okay, so let's talk about this boat trip. As I've mentioned before, the biggest criticism by far of the Fantasia arc deals with these boat chapters. Now when you read them straight through or volume by volume, I honestly don't think it's that bad. You get them setting off for their journey, then the final epic finale of the Millennium Empire arc with Griffith versus Ganeshka. Then we cut back and experience the crew making a pit stop on a mysterious island where the sea god awakens. Again, very mixed with fans, but I think it adds a whole new perspective to the kind of world that our characters now find themselves in, and it also offers some really great action moments. Then we got a flashback of Guts for a few chapters, as well as we get to see exactly how Falconia is set up, and the inner workings through the eyes of a fan favorite character that we hadn't seen in a long time, good old motherfucking Ricker and his pimp slap of justice. Then after that, we cut back to our main group as they arrive at their destination of Skelling Island and Elfhelm. A few detours along the way, but overall I think it works very well for the flow of the story. Here's the issue though. If you were trying to follow Berserk chapter to chapter at the time, well... Guts' crew technically set sail and left Vertanis on August 11th, 2006, 
in our time. And the chapter where they finally arrive came out on November 27th, 2015. Yeah, that is literally almost 10 years of a wait for the boat trip to be over. As I mentioned, the gaps in between chapters and the returning hiatus became more and more frequent during the Fantasia arc, and I think it's its biggest blow as far as how people view the series. Because instead of being able to enjoy the journey, people became desperate just to see something get accomplished. I did not become a fan of Berserk until 2018, so I cannot imagine how destitute people became in wanting to finally see Elfhelm. If you want to get even crazier than that, you could think, okay, when did Guts decide to head to Elfhelm in the first place? This would be back in Chapter 181 when Puck suggested it, which was published on June 22, 2001. So from conception of the goal to finally reaching it, we are talking about 14 years worth of waiting to get to Elfhelm. And hey, I'm all about it's about the journey and not the destination, but I think it's fair to put into context in our real world time, and at least be able to understand fans' frustrations when it comes to the boat. And I know a lot of you wouldn't mind being on a boat with Roderick and Guts for a decade, if you know what I'm talking about. But alas, it was a long time, and we have finally landed ashore. And let's not forget the reason why we are here. This is for Casca. Originally, to take her someplace where she would be safe from the demons coming for her brand, and then for the possibility of healing her mind. And so we get one of those rare moments where Guts is able to smile as he thanks his comrades, knowing that it took all of them to get this far, and it really is a sweet moment to see Guts, of all people, not only being able to breathe a sigh of relief, but also to be excited for the coming possibilities of what arriving here could actually mean for his beloved. And there's a cute moment of Puck recounting why he left Elfhelm in the first place, reworking his fight with a seagull into some sort of epic battle scenario, reaching a middle ground and then riding on the seagull's back, only to then fall asleep and roll off of it onto a random boat. I think this is a really funny moment, and it also got me hopeful for perhaps, maybe, possibly, some development for Puck since he's been steadily doing less and less ever since being introduced to the new characters. So could he have possibly been exiled from the island for some reason? Maybe he has a long history of mischief here. Maybe he's made waves in the past. Maybe there are mourning characters who thought he might be dead. Maybe he's the key to some important piece of information. Yeah, don't get your hopes up for any of that. Docking off of the boat, our main crew prepares to explore the island. We have Guts, Casca, Farnese, Serpico, Shurike, Isidro, Puck and Avalara, as well as Roderick, a few of his nameless crew members, Magnifico, Isma, and Azan. I mean, the fearless mustache knight. And that's quite a bit of characters to explore the island, and definitely the biggest our group has ever been. Before embarking, Isma's mom gives her a shell which allows them to communicate, somehow, and she also makes them aware that time moves differently on the island than it does in the outside world, a very important fact that will no doubt play a factor in the upcoming chapters. In fact, we have heard of this before. The same thing happened around Flora's mansion, and we also had the story of Peacock, a children's tale that spoke of Peacock believing that he was an elf, so he ran to the Misty Valley, but he stayed too long, and when he returned, several decades had passed. This is a scary thought, as we know right now the entire world, or what's left of it, is pretty much humanity being herded into Falconia under Griffith's reign. So it begs the question, if Guts and crew are here for a while, then just how many years will pass on the outside? And what will become of the world by then? Many questions that will soon hopefully be answered. The first thing the crew finds are a bunch of gravestones that Puck does not recognize, and enchanted in a way that they are meant to confuse and misdirect people as a deterrent for newcomers stumbling upon the island, and is sort of like a magical labyrinth in a way, placed here after the merging of the astral and physical worlds. So how do they find their way around this? Well. They tie a string to Puck and have him lead the way as the magic won't affect an inhabitant of the island. It's as silly as it sounds and again one of those little moments that makes Guts smile. And wait, is Guts even laughing here? Do we actually have a genuine laugh coming from Guts? Holy shit, this is iconic. Well they manage to get through the maze, only to arrive in a pumpkin patch awakening a bunch of scarecrows. These creatures seem to be just made out of straw and whatever else but they carry large size and pitchforks. Technically, they are also considered golems, and remember a golem can be made out of any material, really. 
It's simply an object that's being controlled by a magical entity, usually for protection and defense. It's just like when they first arrived at Flora's. And we're gonna see a lot of parallels to Flora's mansion and here on the island. And they obviously feel no pain and have no emotions. They're just enacting their enchantment programming. So Guts and company begin their attack and look at Roderick pulling out a sword and telling his crew to protect the women. What a motherfucking boss, a gentleman and a scholar. I appreciate you, Roderick. From the distance, there's a few inhabitants of the island covered in shadow for now, mentioning that they sent some magic from the intruders, and another denying it, stating that all outsiders are just savages, just giving us a small glimpse into how they view the outside world. And also, just simply looking at a character like Guts, that's, of course, sort of the vibe that you would get. Another great creature are these Halloween horror-looking pumpkins, and as a horror fan, I really appreciate this. They also kind of remind me something out of Goosebumps, and I promise that's not an insult, that's awesome. But since hacking and slashing vegetables isn't exactly super effective, Shurike uses a spell borrowing power from the Earth Elementals in order to stop the creatures from the ground itself. Since the Guts team has thwarted every line of defense so far, someone else watching sends out their biggest obstacle, a giant burning wicker man. And this thing is awesome. Again, working kind of like a golem, but enhanced by being filled with burning souls, using their life force, or I guess lack thereof, sort of like fuel for its power. Something like this seems a little too, uh, evil for a place that's supposedly a peaceful land like Elfhelm. And as the other golems were just inanimate objects, but this one is actually using dead souls. And you would be right, that's kind of evil. It's immediately mentioned that this sort of magic is taboo here. But who would be so brave, so bold, and so confident to make this happen anyway? Well, we here are meeting the big titty goth GF of our dreams. I introduce you to Morda. Uh, 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 yeah. A witch so hot that she could probably keep the wicker man burning all on her own. Gotta love a girl with a dark side. And she says, what good is a puppet if you don't play with it? And all I can think of is just, nope, 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 must not simp. Though I do wish the fight against the wicker man was a little bit longer, I can't deny how fucking raw of a move Guts uses to defeat it. Doing a power slide on his back to go underneath it and then blasting his arm cannon up through its crotch, bringing it to its knees, and then finally slicing it open with his dragon slayer, releasing all of the souls back into the ether. Her and the other mages that use the scarecrows and the pumpkins fret over the fire from the wicker man that's now burning the field around them, but a rain cloud immediately appears to drown it out. Not naturally, of course, it was a manipulation of air and water elementals by a very powerful magic user, none other than this short little badass riding up on a goat. Ironic, since he is a goat. This is Gedfring, the head magic guru of the island and teacher of these mages in training. We know that Miura is a big Star Wars fan, so I can't help but wonder if having this small, powerful wizard is some sort of inspiration taken from Yoda. He immediately shows that he has a powerful and confident presence, apologizing for their troubles, telling Morda she needs to be scolded, <clears throat> I wouldn't mind helping with that, and he remembers who Puck is and wonders where he's been. He also mentions receiving a dream premonition from Flora that her pupil and her team would be coming to the island, which is very cool and makes us wonder was Flora able to communicate in his dream post her death, or was it beforehand? Since we know that dreams can be a means of communication from the astral world, it would make sense that if it was after her death. As well, if she's able to communicate, it also shows that not every person that dies is thrown into the abyss, only those that have been in contact with demon kind. Introductions are made as the other three witches in training introduce themselves as Kuka, Joni, and Theuni. I, I don't know how to pronounce that name, and I haven't really been able to remember their names yet, really. And our main crew speaks of their purpose for being here, for Casca, in which Kuka mentions that she heard that the king of the island being able to use something called the Corridor of Dreams to heal someone's mind, in which we get yet another genuine smile out of guts. Gotta love it. Gedfring leads them to a village where the architecture again is very reminiscent of Flora's mansion, and Miura gets to showcase his artistic skill at depicting this magical island that we have heard so much about for so long. 
filled with young students practicing spells and connecting to the elementals the same way that Shurike had, most focusing on their dedication, whereas Morta seems to be more excited to learn about the outside world. Simping aside, introducing a character like Morta is kind of a wild card. She's not an evil character, she's just someone who's bored of being cooped up and is looking for excitement also is clearly willing to go to the extreme measures very quickly. Someone that in all honesty is probably not trustworthy and yet again might prove to be a valuable asset if she's on your side. She can go either way at this point and it's a great way to keep the reader in suspense because unlike all the other characters here, you really can't predict how she's going to react to something. The characters enter a huge tree mansion, many unique and quirky characters are inside including three old mages playing chess, and they seem very kooky, and a girl named Danon who greets them as well. They ask their new guest to take a seat while they make some tea but Guts interrupts. He requests to see the Flower Storm Monarch right away, which is so in character for Guts, because he's not someone that would care about the luxury and not someone to traditionally value patience. Nor has Guts ever given special treatment to authority, he's here for a purpose but his crew is hungry, they do need rest, and there needs to be some sort of communication and a getting to know you vibe before making any requests to their king. So Guts reluctantly agrees to wait. They all sit around a big dinner table alongside the mages and enjoy a meal. I also love how gigantic Guts' sword is leaning up against the table. That's awesome. But this scene and chapter is basically once again a big exposition dump. And hey, we kind of need one. A lot's happened and we need to recap and it also makes sense that Guts' crew would need to explain their journey to everyone here and how they arrived here at all. But there are some big revelations that happen here. First of all, Gedfring explains that the Hawk of Light was responsible for the great roar of the astral world. So for context, remember that Guts and his crew was already in the middle of the ocean when Griffith cut through Ganeshka with the Baylet Sword Swing. From that moment, all that powerful astral energy was unleashed, the dimension was cut into, and the astral and physical worlds merged into one, unleashing monsters across the entire planet and increasing magical energy everywhere. This is a big deal to mention because technically, the only person that knows Guts' ties to the Hawk of Light are Puck, who knows the entire story, and Shurike, who knows who the Hawk of Light is on Earth and knows that he's responsible for branding Guts and Casca. The rest of the group has no idea about Guts' connection to Griffith or even really that Griffith is the Hawk of Light. Serpico had mentioned knowing who Griffith was by reputation because of everything that he did for Midland back in the Golden Age arc, but they do not know that Griffith is now a god hand leading people to the salvation of Falconia. Guts isn't the type to speak about his personal history, so all they know is that he and Casca are branded demons come after them, and that they needed to get here to Elfhelm to be safe. The Band of the Hawk, the Eclipse, and the God Hand, they do not know. The most we can assume is that Shurike may have mentioned the Hawk of Light off-page somewhere during the travels, but we can safely say that none of them other than Puck knows that Griffith and the Hawk of Light are the same. Well, here at this dinner table conversation, all is finally revealed. Well, at least about the Hawk of Light's identity being Griffith, and that he is responsible for merging the worlds. We are also told that this is possible because of the world tree, which is basically what Ganeshka's body turned into after his death, a giant fissure linking the worlds together, its branches sprawling across the sky known as the Elfin and Dragon Paths, and they are kind of like holding the world together and can be used as a means of travel as we've seen with the Moonlight Boy. And it's reconfirmed that on occasions the paths would overlap the worlds allowing someone to pass from one world to the other, but it would be on very rare occasions, also usually happening during a full moon when magical energy is stronger, and usually involving children as they are more open-minded to the spiritual slash supernatural. This is done through the Elfin Paths, which link the worlds, and the Dragon Paths reach into the deepest layers of the Astral World. And Guts has actually already been through a dragon path once before, but was unaware. Gedfring mentions that the Baylet Guts carries with him, a fetish for transporting somebody deep into the astral world, traveling by means of the dragon path. Only question now is if the astral and physical worlds are one thing, how deep into the astral world has been merged with the physical? We have yet to see the god hand or the abyss on this plane, but that doesn't mean that they're not here somewhere. Only time will tell, but I would imagine that there's still another phase to happen in order to bring the abyss here. And if my theory is correct, it directly correlates with Elfhelm's existence. Because the next bit of information that we get is the explanation as to why Griffith sent so many apostles to destroy Flora's mansion. It all has to do with the spirit trees. 
the symbolism of trees, roots, and branches, and how everything is connected. Trees like the one at Flora's were part of maintaining balance between the worlds, as her spirit tree would suck energy from the world tree, thus hindering it from fully connecting the two worlds. Basically what this means is that because of numerous individual spirit trees throughout the world, it would take power away from the world tree and keep the physical and astral world separate, as it should be, maintaining balance. The world of man and the world of the dead. By going around and burning down the spirit trees, Griffith made a way for the world tree to be brought into existence. It was all part of the plan from the very beginning, and Flora serves as sort of like a guardian to the spirit tree. Griffith knew she was powerful, and that's why he sent so many apostles there to kill her and burn down the tree. Guts and company being there was just a happenstance. Or maybe it was causality. So anyway, my theory is that the final spirit tree, and the most powerful one, is probably located here on Elfhelm, which means with my theory, Griffith and company would eventually show up here. I hope that all makes sense. Exposition and lore dump chapters can be rough. You can basically think about it as big tree bad, small trees good. Gedfring then questions Guts about the Hawk of Light's identity as a man. Who was Griffith? What did he want so badly that he would change the entire world? Guts has pause before he answers. It's been so long since he's had to talk about Griffith, speaking it into words becomes difficult as it represents this thorn within him that he's tried to ignore, tried to remove ever since his quest for vengeance had turned into protection for Casca. But this is the moment to explain. He says simply that Griffith will have his own kingdom like he's always wanted, and Gedfring confirms that this is the reality and that Falconia has risen up from the ruins of Geyseric's ancient kingdom. Isidro putting two and two together, realizing that if Guts was in Griffith's mercenary band, then Guts must have known the famous 100-man slayer. I always thought that was a really funny moment from Isidro. So Gedfring mentions that creating the only safe haven and the only kingdom in the world is a surefire way to achieve that ultimate dream. But then we get an ominous reply from Guts, that he believes that if that's what Griffith has now, that it won't end there. That knowing Griffith, at least from his human days, he knows Griffith has an insatiable appetite for power and control. Gut says that Griffith will continue to soar higher because that's what he does, he's the hawk. And the outcome of what this could mean is so menacing because we have wondered since Griffith's transformation into a god hand, how much of Griffith still remains. He's the embodiment of his dream and darkest tendencies brought to the surface now, a god hand wearing a Griffith mask to lead the people. We wonder how much satisfaction Griffith experienced from achieving his kingdom, how much of his own personal goals are at hand as opposed to the ultimate goal of the god hand. Could Griffith still have personal motives unrelated to the god hand's plan? And if that's the case, could each god hand member themselves have a personal motive as well? They have been enacting the will of the supposed idea of evil, an incorporeal entity lurking within the idea world connecting all of consciousness, creating a reality in which they give humanity exactly what they desire, and they have. But if Griffith is a godlike being with a consistent desire for ruling and soaring higher, will that desire within him that leads him, that leads his every action, push him to try to achieve something more even still? Or is he just a pawn himself in service of that higher power? Many questions that Berserk gives us, and gives us plenty to speculate on. But as far as Guts is concerned, thinking of Griffith as the man he knew and knowing his ideology, he knows nothing will stop Griffith from achieving greater heights. And literally, nobody would know this better than Guts himself. Anyway, this will do it for this manga analysis episode. Now everything is on the table. Everybody knows the score, and the next step will be enacting the purpose for the mission, healing Casca's mind which is one of my personal favorite portions of the entire manga. Think that we were done with the lore dumps? <laughs> oh, you silly fool, it is just the beginning. We are in the setup stage of storytelling right now, meaning that we are in a place of getting lots of exposition that we will have context for in upcoming story events. The only issue here is remembering all of it since this is a chapter that came out in August of 2016, and we haven't had any callbacks to it yet. Hiatus is a son of a bitch. Now, as far as the exposition itself, I think it works well and doesn't feel too heavy-handed. It all flows naturally from what the characters are talking about, and we finally reached an area of peace and calmness for Guts and his crew, and it's honestly really nice to see. 
There are admittedly a lot of gripes about the Elf Island chapters, in particular the lack of action, but I think it really comes down to the hiatus of all things. Were it not the case and you weren't waiting months on end for chapters, I don't think people would care as much. I love the calm and quiet moments of Berserk, and normally those are my favorites. The chapters like Wounds, Bonfire of Dreams, Bubbles of Futility, all of these chapters peak at my top favorite, and they all are the slower, more character building moments. The issue is you have a human specimen like Guts, Jack to Kenshiro levels proportion, dressed in black and wielding a gigantic sword in a world of demons, and well, People want to see action with that, and I totally get it. And if you wait five to six months for a chapter and get more dialogue or a Griffith chapter or Isidro goofing off, I can completely understand why that annoys you. But my reply would be, think about Berserk in the bigger picture. Don't think about it as a single chapter, think of the entire story as a whole. How wonderful is it that Guts has painstakingly made his way to his destination, and he is now allowed a little bit of rest, recuperation, and reflection. Not to mention this entire journey has not been for him, it's been for the woman that he loves. Sacrifice. Not in sacrificing others for his own ambition, but sacrificing himself for the love of another. It's a beautiful sentiment at its very core, but I'm getting off track of what we were talking about. Oh yeah, more lore! Elementals. You remember those, right? Tiny little spirits that work to move and manipulate matter. Earth, water, fire, and wind. Sylphs that are in Serpico's sword, salamanders that are in Isidro's daggers, undines for water, and gnomes for earth. Well, in this chapter, we learn that there is actually a fifth elemental that ties all of these together that grounds and pulls them into a unity. These are called Barrett's, weight elementals. Apparently, they are so small they can't even really be tapped into or manipulated by magic, and within this forest of Elfhelm, very few exist which kind of lightens the gravity and allows a Cedro to jump high into a tree. So you can very much say that Barrett's are like a binding element, tying everything into one whole. Gedfring also mentions that Barrett's, when coming together in a high quantity, can do things like darken the sky. Hmm, where have we seen that before? Actually, where have we seen complete darkness manifest into a being? Yeah, I'll get to that in a moment. The most interesting thing he says to me, though, is that the Barretts can cause things like depression and obsession within the mine. Again, where have we seen this before? So, can it be assumed that Guts's trauma and rage and conjuring of negative emotions caused an influx of Barretts within him, manifesting itself into the Beast of Darkness? This is just a theory based on the information here, because I don't want to say that the Beast of Darkness is something outside of Guts. I think that would take away from the importance of what it's meant to represent. But when you think about how negative emotions and energy work to begin with, it very much does feel like a swelling of darkness overtaking you. Have you ever been really irritated and lashed out at someone, and then later on you calmed down and you thought, you know, what was that? Was that really me? Did I really say those things? Almost like a literal demonic energy had been taken over your body for just a moment. I feel like similar ideas can be applied to Berserk. Guts' trauma and the Beast of Darkness, as well as Griffith's obsession with getting his kingdom, dwell from a dark place within themselves. Barrett's just gives a name to that dark energy, but it doesn't take away from it being within the person themselves. Now let's shift this over to the God Hand. If one were to exist and thrive within that energy, you could have a grounding and binding force of nature that deliberately dwells and shares in that negativity. Void the god hand that binds the other four together, just as the fifth elemental ties in the other four elementals. Look, I don't know if this is what Miura is trying to get at, and I'm taking a lot of speculation from just one line of dialogue, but I do think the deliberate setup and introduction of Barrett's directly relates to information about Void, not trying to jump ahead or anything, but we will soon get a glimpse into the past, showcasing the god hand once more. And I think Miura is giving us a tiny piece of the puzzle along the way, the Chitch story, the spirit trees, the weight elementals, it's all meant to come into play later. We have to take this information, rattle it around, and prepare for the storm. In the meantime, we get more elves. Pick, peck, pook, and poke. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say about them. As well, we get this amazing double page spread of Guts and the crew walking through the Elfhelm forest and being witnessed by dozens of magical creatures. 
elves, fawns, brownies, ents, and who knows what else. There are also so many characters on this page, I would love for somebody to take account and say how many that they found. It'd be crazy if Waldo showed up somewhere. He's also kind of magical, I think. The creatures all seem enthralled and interested in the human visitors, wanting to play and to dance and... And whatever these wind creatures are, they're all up on Serpico. Nice. There's unicorns that are here, which remind me of the movie Legend, and it's super wholesome for sure. And it's very cool for Miura to show the other side of the non-human creatures, and that they aren't all just cave-dwelling, women-stealing trolls. And that there is a positive side to all this magic. It takes a girl, Danon, to blow on a horn in order to focus all of them and get back on track, leading the travelers to a gigantic cherry tree. More specifically, a spirit tree. You know, one of those things stopping the world tree from overlapping the worlds completely. This one is so gigantic and powerful, it's like a mountain. And I have to assume, at some point, Griffith and his crew would be looking to burn down this tree just like all the others. But also, because this tree is so large and resonates with so much power, I think it is a very special piece of the puzzle, and maybe the reason the God Hand haven't fully been able to manifest in the physical world just yet. Now some people think that they have and that we just haven't seen them yet, but the truth is nobody really knows. But we didn't just get a whole exposition on spirit trees in the last chapter to be shown this cherry tree the very next chapter and not assume it has something to do with the entire plan. This is storytelling guys, come on. Anyway, they make their way inside the tree into a throne room, currently empty. That is, until Puck flies onto it, declaring himself the Flower Storm Monarch. He then calls out Magnifico for conspiring to take the island and sell the elves, obviously something he could never actually accomplish. And they're both jokingly punished by the other elves, tying them up in vine handcuffs and taking them away. The joke plays out for a bit until Danon, the housekeeper who helped escort them, begins to remove her robes. And no, she's not trying to sell you her OnlyFans. She reveals herself to be a beautiful elf-like creature, though human-sized, and she's absolutely stunning, and her appearance and dress is reminiscent of the very cherry tree that they are inside of. You can imagine that they kept her identity a secret in order to observe and understand the travelers first. Everyone is floored by her transformation, and a sudden surge of comforting energy starts to resonate from her. She officially greets the travelers as her true self, the ruler of Elfhelm, the true Flowerstorm monarch. I mentioned in a video once that in the English translation, the ruler of Elfhelm up until this point was referred to as a king or as a he. You might think that this is a continuity error or a retcon, but it's not. The Japanese word that was used was sort of gender neutral, and the king of Elfhelm was first mentioned years before we got to this point. So you can't blame the translators for seeing the word king and then assuming it to be male. It's just one of those little things that we need to look back on and kind of ignore. Kind of like the whole Falcon, Hawk, Band of the Falcon, Band of the Hawk translation. It doesn't really matter in the end. Languages are funny like that. One thing I love that's subtle but also super sad to me is Gut seeing the monarch reveal, then looking at Casca's infantile behavior, and then immediately going to speak to Danon. He is here for a mission, an objective, a purpose. And like the soldier within him, he wants to accomplish the task. Danon cuts him off though in order to enact punishment on Puck and Magnifico for conspiring to take the throne, and it's as light-hearted and playful as you can imagine in a place like this, as the only sentence they receive is to help the brownie creatures clean up for the rest of the day. After that, it's back to business as Danon declares that they may be able to revive Casca's mind by using the Corridor of Dreams. As such, Guts is especially relieved. To enact whatever this is, Danon tells only Farnese and Shurike to come along with her, along with Casca, sensing the attachment Casca has towards Farnese and knowing Shurike's magical skill. As Guts wishes to come along too, Danon halts him, saying that the fear that she senses within Casca towards him could hinder the ritual. This is devastating for Guts as it's the beginning of him feeling, well, useless. His skills are combat, physical battle, and in a land of peace and magic, there is not much for him to contribute to. And when it comes to Casca, he has been her protector for so long. For her to be out of his sight that far and knowing that he is powerless to help or not knowing if anything is going to go wrong, well, I imagine it's kind of like seeing a loved one go in for an important surgery. You're completely out of your element and can only wait and have faith in the people performing the operation. So what is the Corridor of Dreams? 
On one hand, it's exactly as it sounds. We enter the dreams of Casca. From there, Farnese and Shirake are meant to decipher and interpret what they see and piece together Casca based on that information. But the warning that the dreams are, though similar to entering the astral world, are based upon the rules of the dreamer. We have learned a long time prior that dreams are a gateway into the astral world and the best way to communicate with people and even implant ideas. We've all seen how Griffith and the God Hand planted an Inception-style technique into humanity as a collective whole. During the Conviction arc, we got a chapter called Revelations that spoke about humanity having a dream of Midland being ravaged by plague and war, only to be drenched in darkness, and the only shining light coming from its prophesied savior, the Hawk of Light implanting the idea that Griffith would come way before he came back into the world. We also had a scene where our boy, motherfucking Zod, <laughs> was having a little sleepy time, and he encountered the embodiment of Griffith within his dream. Zod attacked, testing the might of who have may become his superior, and lost that fight, losing one of his horns in the process an attack that was able to wound on both an astral and physical level, and permanently removed his horn, and has been the only injury that Zod has been unable to regenerate from. This shows us that dreams and berserk can be more than just dreams. Gateways into people's subconscious, and things can have an effect from the dream world into the physical. If there are supposed to be three worlds that overlap in berserk, the physical, astral, and idea worlds, I would say that the dreamscape is mostly linked to the idea world, that collective consciousness of all life that I often talk about. But even more so, perhaps dreams are what link all three worlds together in its truest sense. In a dream, the rules are based upon your own ego, and yet you are connected to others and you have an awareness that goes beyond what your physical body can perceive. Add that to the fact that Berserk's themes often revolve around individuals' dreams of accomplishing something and finding oneself, we then have a lot of symbolism that we can plug into. But what does it all mean? I don't know. I think it just means that dreams are powerful and a way for us not only to perceive, but to be perceived. Better than we ever could in the physical world. But then there's a big glaring issue that we also have to address. And that is magic. Magic was something that was very limited during the first half of the series. And ever since Griffith's return, Shurike's introduction, and so forth, magic has become a bigger and bigger factor in the story. And just like all stories featuring any kind of powers or special abilities, you need to keep upping the ante in order to raise the stakes. The issue here is that Casca has a very realistic trauma that we need to address. She was raped and had her mind broken to a state of regression in that she now acts like a toddler. This is very serious stuff, and there's a psychological condition not quite like this, but similar, in the sense where people regress to a younger state of mind in order to find that comfort when they can't handle an intense trauma. This was a serious changing point in the story. It gave Guts motivation and an understanding that he needs to face the sadness that he experienced, as well as the darkness within himself. And Casca has been in this regressed state much longer than she was ever in her true self in the manga. So... After all this time of having her like this, and the impact that it has made to the story, to all of a sudden say, hey, we can fix this with magic, it becomes a little bit of a rocky area. Some may say that it takes away from the importance of that trauma if it can just be fixed so easily by superpowers and not by any sort of emotional reflection on Casca's part. People want to see her strength and see her push through this as Guts pushed through his as his Black Swordsman persona to do it in a natural and grounded way, and I completely understand that sentiment. But the dreamscape sequence in Berserk, I think does a very good job at mixing these two equations. Because yes, they are using fantasy slash magic type solutions to this problem, but we are also delving into and focusing on key events in Casca's life and what they mean to her. We are exploring her mind from the point of view of other characters, and will literally be piecing together different aspects of Casca's character. And by the end of it, it won't be a perfect fix. There are still things for her to overcome, but this gets the ball rolling. It puts us into a place of understanding, and expectation is still yet to be met. So I don't know, are we too far into the fantasy genre now that magic can just solve everything? And what stakes can we expect if that's the case? How exhilarating is it to see Guts swing a sword now that there are characters that can alter minds and change the weather on a whim? They're good questions to ask, 
But regardless of what you think about it, this is where we are now. And as we enter into the dream world, we see Shurike's dream of how she envisions Isidro as a literal monkey, and she makes her way into Farnese's dream, where she's using a stone that looks like Mosgus's head in order to wash everyone's clothes, being the caretaker that she is. And from there, the two venture into Casca's dream, starting at first with some comical drawings of what Casca's regressed mind must envision the team as, a very surface-level dream, and then they follow the guiding petals into her mind where we get an amazing page turn showing us a clear image of the eclipse, the truth buried deep within her subconscious. That truth leads the girls into a barren wasteland of death, flags planted all around most likely representing the monsters that killed the band of the hawk, and how Casca envisions Guts and herself within this nightmare world, is Guts is here as a broken and wounded hound, a shade of his beast of darkness, and a shade of the mad dog that she used to call him. Here looking like he's gotten the shit kicked out of him, stabbed, and tied around his neck as a chain, dragging a casket, a casket with the Band of the Hawk crest upon it. So even if Casca on a surface level fears Guts, deep down her true self does at least recognize the brutal reality of how he's been carrying the deaths upon his shoulders. For better or worse, Guts has taken the responsibility and is unable to let go of it no matter how wounded he becomes. The flags begin to take life, turning into flying demonic creatures that attack and stab the Guts Hound as well as the casket. Casca understanding how often Guts is attacked and forced to fight back. But this time, Shurke and Farnese are here within the dream, and they are actually able to physically help the Guts Hound, warding off the creatures. Now remember, we are in a dream, so these creatures aren't technically real per se, they are manifestations. But just like Danon says, the dreamer makes the rules. And just like every Freddy Krueger movie that I ever saw, the threats are still real. The mind overcomes all things, and if it believes the danger is real and can hurt, then so it will be. As Shurike and Farnese inspect the Hound in the casket, they conclude that this is her representation of Guts. As well, inside the casket is a broken doll representing Casca herself, broken to pieces just as her mind has been since that day. The only thing moving is a small little chibi version of Casca, acting just like her typical toddler self in the real world. From moving around a lot, to being comforted by Farnese, going right towards her sort of like a pet to its master. It's like the only part of Casca that has an awareness. And from here, their mission becomes very clear. Shurike and Farnese must travel the barren landscape of Casca's repressed memories and try to put the doll back together following a path of petals that's contributed by Danon to help lead them to the areas of her mind where they need to go. Personally, I love the idea of this. I love the setup, and particularly I love that it's Shurike and Farnese that have to do this. I do like that Guts is unable to help, both because of what it does for his character feeling helpless, and it also gives the other characters time to shine in an adventure that doesn't involve Guts being able to help. Well, at least not the actual Guts. Casca's manifestation of Guts is another story. The entire dreamscape scenario will dive into both fantasy action and serious topics regarding the specific type of trauma Casca is facing, and we are going to get one of the most satisfying revivals I've read in any manga. So please, I hope you come back for the next episode of this analysis series because Casca, after 22 years in the manga releases, will finally return. I'd like to begin this video with a quote from Carl Jung on dreams, Jung's work often being a very important influence on Berserk itself. The dream is often occupied with apparently very silly details, producing an impression of absurdity, or else it is on the surface so unintelligible that it leaves us thoroughly bewildered. Hence we always have to overcome a certain resistance before we can seriously set about disentangling the intricate web through patient work. When at last we penetrate to its real meaning, we find ourselves deep in the dreamer's secrets and discover with astonishment that an apparently quite senseless dream is in the heightened degree significant, and that in reality it speaks only of important and serious matters. The evolutionary stratification of the psyche is more clearly discernible in the dream than in the conscious mind. In the dream, the psyche speaks in images and gives expressions to its instincts which derive from the most primitive levels of nature. Through the assimilation of the unconscious contents, the momentary life of consciousness can once more be brought into harmony with the law of nature from which it's too easily departed from, and the patient can be led back to the natural law of his own being. 
The dream shows the inner truth and reality of the patient as it really is, not as I conjecture it to be, and not as he would like it to be, but as it is. The dream is specifically the utterance of the unconscious. Just as the psyche has a diurnal side which we call consciousness, so also it has a nocturnal side, the unconscious psychic activity which we apprehend as a dreamlike fantasy. Dreams are often anticipatory and would lose their specific meaning on a purely causalistic view. They afford unmistakable information about the analytical situation, the correct understanding of which is the greatest therapeutic importance. Dreams are, invariably, seeking to express something that the ego does not know and does not understand. Last time, we began our journey into the deeper aspects of Casca's mind, into the corridor of dreams. But this next chapter begins back on Elfhelm, where they have decided to hold a banquet-like party for their new guests. And it is really interesting seeing Roderick's crew intermingling with all the mythological astral creatures here on the island. It's such a departure from the idea that every single astral being wants to savagely murder you. And again, it shows us there is a positive side to it all, and a way to incorporate humanity alongside magical beings, if that were the case. Perhaps similar to the way the world used to be thousands of years ago. Away from the gathering, of course, is Guts, who is sitting alone, staring at the spirit tree, where Casca is currently undergoing her procedure, for lack of a better word. And here is actually one of my favorite scenes in the entire manga, I'm not even kidding. Serpico and Roderick walk up to Guts wanting to share a drink with him, and we get this amazing moment of these three guys just chilling out and reflecting on their lives and their journey together. And I love moments like this. I love to see the characters I adore just hanging out. It doesn't always have to be about the plot, the plot, the plot. I love moments where it takes time to breathe and lets the characters feel like real people. And as far as a dark, dark fantasy manga filled with demons is concerned, this is a very real moment. Because in this moment, I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that there is a feeling that for Guts, Serpico and Roderick are no longer just companions on his journey, but maybe actually friends. People he considers as close to him as perhaps Judo and Pippin were once. They have faced life or death situations together, and they have also had a role to play that without them, they may not have made it this far. Guts reflects all the way back to the beginning of the manga, even showing a brief panel of him facing off against the Snake Apostle. This helps the entire manga feel like one cohesive story, and it also can act as a setup for the endgame that may be arriving shortly after. But Guts recounts on his own, he was willing to die in pursuit of his vengeance. But after going back to Casca, and with the inclusion of new members into his group, he had to leave that piece of him behind and be able to rely on other people. A well-given thanks is needed, to which Serpico replies questioning if Guts is drunk already. I just love that little back and forth that they have, and even Guts can be comfortable enough to joke around with them. Especially Serpico, who has actively stated plenty of times that he would kill Guts once before. And speaking of Serpico, he reflects on his journey as well. How during their days under the Holy Sea Nights, things were a lot simpler. But when Farnese met Guts, and began questioning not just her faith, but her place in the world, it allowed her an outlet to discover who she was as a person, and what she deemed as valuable. And that Casca also helped Farnese find a purpose within her own life, having somebody to watch over and protect. Similar to Guts's current purpose, it's as if caring for, watching over, and protecting the people you love is within itself purpose enough to keep on living. We get the least amount of reflection from Roderick, but the man is such a chad that we understand he has too many epic amazing stories to tell in just a few pages. But he does admit that risking their lives on the high seas for a woman is the kind of thing that makes him feel alive. What a motherfucking boss. The man is literally willing to fight ghost pirates and go into the mouth of a sea god all for his duty as a man to protect the ladies. Roderick is a goddamn hero of the people, you guys. But as they talk among each other, Guts' gaze goes back to the cherry tree, recounting the words of Skull Knight that Casca's wish may not be his wish. Is Guts' wish to be with her again like they were before? To be in a working relationship? Or is Guts' ultimate wish to finally finish what he started and get vengeance on Griffith? And as for Casca's wish, well, we just have to wait and see. Within Casca's mind, Shirake and Farnese must travel the wastelands that represent the emptiness of Casca's current state of mind ripped away by the single traumatic event that they are here to find. 
and piece by piece they will find other prominent memories as they go. The first they find is the campfire that illuminated a memory of Guts sitting on a hilltop overlooking the Band of the Hawks camp, from one of the most important chapters of that era, the Campfire of Dreams. Now how this works is fairly interesting in that Shirke and Farnese are within Casca's mind, and therefore connected to her on some level of feeling and emotion as well. As they witness this memory, they feel their heartbeat and the tender warmth that Casca felt in that moment. It was probably the first moment where Casca recognized her feelings for Guts. In the original chapter, the two stand over top of the camp and relate to each other, and relate that the bonfire is like a single dream of each of the Band of the Hawk members, and that all the fires together create the greater dream of Griffith and his desire for his own kingdom. The tragic fact here being that despite all of these men having dreams of their own to achieve, they are swallowed by the greater fire of Griffith's dream. But here was also the moment where Guts admitted that he felt like he didn't have one. He didn't know what he was fighting for, and he wanted to find out. It being too soon to realize that the reason for him to fight was standing right here next to him, Casca. Casca gives him strength in that she grounds him and suppresses the darkness of his mindless killing. This is why the Beast of Darkness is so adamantly wishing for Casca to be destroyed. With Casca around, the beast within Guts can never assume complete control. And of course, that beast is an aspect of Guts as well, and perhaps his true test is to tame it in spite of Casca's presence. But that's a situation for another time. Here we are focusing on Casca's feelings, and with them being shared from an important memory, a fragment of the Casca doll is dropping at the girl's feet. The Guts hound along with them picks it up and scratches at the coffin that he carries. And as the chibi Casca runs from the dog, he still places the piece where it needs to go, slowly beginning to reassemble the broken Casca doll, putting her back together, restoring the important memories that make up who she is as a person. Essentially, this is the opposite of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. In that film, an operation team go into a man's mind to erase his memories one by one. In this scenario, we are restoring Casca's memories and piecing her back together, each memory having a significant impact in her life, and without, she wouldn't be the Casca that we know. To block this from happening, there are flying monsters that loom above them, serving as part of the mind that does not wish to restore these memories. And in a way, I think they serve as protection, as in the entire reason for the memories being blotted out wasn't due to anything supernatural, Casca's mind was brought into a regressed state because the trauma was too much for her to handle. So in essence, a regressed state of mind is the body's way of protecting itself, to remove the source of pain and discomfort. The body does not care about its stability as much as it cares that it continues to survive. Casca's mind broke in that the only way for her to conceivably go on was to not be able to think about these horrific events. Think about someone with agoraphobia, the fear of leaving their own house. To protect itself from the anxiety induced by going outside, the mind makes the body feel as though it's almost physically incapable of leaving the home. It's trying to avoid panic attacks and further breakdowns, but also to stay in that state of being is equally dangerous in that you will never be able to be your true self again. Shurike and Farnese are here to metaphorically break through the mental block that Casca's body has put up. And that's why I think these chapters are really something special, because even though magic is at play, the idea behind healing someone's mind is understandable and in the way that they must go about it. This portion of the story also serves as a look back at Berserk as a whole, and how far that we've come in the story. From the memory of Casca meeting Guts for the first time, to the Battle of Doldri, and Casca's victory over Adan, I love the inclusion of the girls saying Casca felt disgusted around him, and each time the girls are feeling the emotion that Casca felt during that memory, connecting them to her and giving them greater understanding about the impact of the memories. The memory of her first meeting of Griffith, her white knight savior at the time, the man who originally gave her purpose and whom she loved before Guts. How important the fragment from this memory must have been and the rush of conflicting feelings surging through Farnese and Shurike as they discover this. More important memories are shown to us in a montage, the feeling of victory at the Midland Banquet after the Battle of Doldri, 
When Casca and Guts were stuck in the cave together, Casca's feeling of jealousy that Griffith gives Guts all of his focus and attention, taking away Casca's place even further, unable to be Griffith's woman or his right hand, as Guts represented first someone who took everything away from her, but then became her everything. Guts was willing to fight 100 men to protect Casca before he even realized why he was doing it. The 100 man fight, I still stand by that this was Guts fighting for Casca as a precursor and foreshadowing of what his life would become. Guts himself just didn't realize it at the time. It was innate within him. The irony that the whole her wish may not be your wish thing, as Guts wishes to protect Casca, but he told Casca to run so that she could go back to what her wish was at the time, to be with Griffith. Guts couldn't let her die because he wanted her to be happy. He wanted her to fulfill her dream. But like I said, Guts just didn't realize what the reasons were behind his decision yet. That's my interpretation of it anyway, as all these videos have ever been. Nothing more than how I view the story and decide to share it with you. Never take me as some sort of authority source on Berserk, please. The memory of Guts vs. Griffith before Guts left the Band of the Hawk, Farnese feels the deep confliction and sadness within Casca at the time, and knowing that she had to watch Guts walk away, it was a feeling of incredible loss. Which leads into the next memory at the Waterfall, where Casca battled Guts and then confided within him. Willing to end her own life over the stress of having to lead the Band of the Hawk and the lack of purpose that she felt with knowing that her dream would never be fulfilled but saved by Guts once again, and falling for the man that has always been willing to bleed for her, always been by her side, and always protected her, as a comrade and as a lover. And even though this page turn here is hilarious, and it goes into Casca's memory of when her and Guts had sex, and Farnese covering Shurike's eyes, but it also makes Farnese fully realize the relation between Guts and Casca. Yes, Farnese has always known the truth, but Guts being the silent man that he is and Casca unable to communicate, it was never explicitly confirmed to her. Because I think it's pretty obvious that Farnese has a giant crush on Guts. I mean, who wouldn't? She even zapped herself back into her physical body once on the ship, not wanting to hear Guts' answer to Roderick's question, what is Casca to you? Because knowing that Casca and Guts are lovers could signify the truth for Farnese that, well, one, she and Guts will never be an item, but also, if Casca is healed, she will lose her role as a caretaker. Farnese has the subtle feeling that restoring Casca, that her own purpose and wish will be taken from her. Even trying to say that what she feels is Casca's feelings alone, trying to convince herself to stop feeling what she does for Guts because soon, it's not gonna matter. If Casca is back, then her and Guts will continue where they left off. Or at least, that's how it seems to Farnese and that fear of losing her place in the group because of it. But more and more, the memories of the glory days are gone through, and Shurke has been using her traditional magic spells to make it through the creatures in their path, from golems to the fire wheel to water spirits, so far all serving to protect them well. The girls mention it feels like they've been traveling for months, as time is truly ambiguous in a dream world. But they see in the distance what looks like a tower, and above it is the eclipse sun. And as the doll is almost assembled back together, that leaves the darkest hidden memories to get to, the ones that caused her mind to break. Before they go there, the little chibi casket inside the doll grabs their attention, and for the first time, it speaks. An indication that Casca is on her way to be restored. And chibi Casca simply says, there is somebody that she would like to see. Farnese, of course, assumes that she is talking about Guts, and that she will see him when this is over, but Chibi Casca could also be referring to what she has always been drawn to even in her regressed state, which is her child. As the girls move through a landscape of corpses and thorns, they are confronted with more manifestations of Casca's subconscious. Getting closer to the event that actually broke her mind, the subconscious creatures also begin to represent that said trauma. That's a penis! And by that I mean... Yes, they're dicks. This is one of those moments in the manga that is simultaneously poetic, disgusting, and unintentionally maybe a little funny, just to see literal dick monsters. Especially that they, uh, they spit. But I think it's also important to remember that Casca was not just raped by Griffith, 
but it's assumed that she was by multiple apostles as well before that. This makes the idea of the traumatic monster Cox being manifested make a lot of sense, as the apostles are nothing more than indulgent beasts enacting their most primal desires, and having the power to do so. Before Casca even descended into Femto's hands, she was already in a weakened daze from the Apostles' abuse. And this poor girl has gone through so much, to imagine that her mind is even possible to recover is the most fantastical thing about this sequence. As the variety of dick monsters increases, Shurke uses her greatest hits to combat them, reminding us of all the various spells she's used over the manga. The golems, the water spirits, the earth spirits, and the flame wheel. And as more and more dicks approach them as if they just opened an OnlyFans account, Farnese decides to release a weapon of her own. A giant Mosgus head. Hey, we're in a dream, anything can happen. And though Mosgus represents a former era of Farnese's life and being able to use that to her benefit has some significance, I just can't get over how on this page we literally get to see Mosgus eat a bunch of dicks. <laughs> how many times did we wish this would happen back in the Conviction arc when he was on one of his preaching rants? I, I just I love to see it. Shirke and Farnese travel through more and more of the thorns trying to keep them away the mind protecting itself from having to become aware once more and deal with the truth. And then they see their goal. The final fragment, protected in a casing of thorns underneath the eclipse, very similar to the womb-like imagery that we saw when Griffith was going through his transformation into Femto, as I suppose the eclipse signifies the creation of both. And soaring above them to keep them away is the gigantic manifestation of what I think we can safely call a true Hawk of Darkness. Femto here is represented by the biggest and most powerful creature within the dreamscape, and in a pure falcon-like form looking like Rodan circling above them, spreading a miasma that manifests all of the classic apostles that we saw in the eclipse. And remember that the girls are feeling the emotions that Casca had felt, that terror, tragedy, and sense of ultimate powerlessness, pure fear of being trapped in a hell dimension with no way out. There is a reason that the Eclipse is the most talked about and pivotal Berserk sequence, and it's not just because it's when Griffith became a god hand. It's that feeling of absolute despair. But whereas Casca was helpless with nothing but a broken sword, here in the dream world, Shurike and Farnese are at least able to use their magic to the fullest extent to help combat the Apostles, to give them the space to try to drag this coffin up the side of the thorn-filled mountain that they are surrounded by. The Hawk of Darkness targets the coffin itself, making perfect sense as it was Femto that broke Casca's mind, so the natural instinct here for it in the dream world is to break the doll once more. But the Guts Hound tries desperately to defend against it. Farnese lets out more from her bag, first Serpico's cloak to help free the coffin, and then the Berserker armor itself. Which in the most badass way ever attaches to the Guts Hound, making a full dog-like version of the armor. And I, I don't know what to say from here, it's literally full berserker mode guts but as a hound. It's tail becoming the dragon slayer, and cannon blast being fired out of its mouth. It's absolute insanity and Miura fully embracing the dream scenario in which he has created. Nothing is off limits here, and we just go with it and embrace how fucking awesome it is. Guts battles the dream Fento in a way that gives us our first battle between Guts and Griffith post-Eclipse. And comparatively, Griffith is still a gigantic, more powerful force despite Guts' power up. And this whole race to get up the side of the mountain thing here presented is incredibly gripping. There's no actual time constraint on this, but it feels like there is when you read it. Like, can Farnese and Shurike get this coffin to the top before they are run over and destroyed by the Apostles and Femto? Meanwhile, you have the Guts Hound and the Golems and everything else fighting back. There's just such an intensity to it that I think will be mirrored later on when we get to the real battle in the real world. And to make things even wilder, we have something very special happen from Shurike's hat. And this is the return of Flora. And by return, I truly mean that. This is something new as far as the lore and understanding of the Berserk world is concerned. And yet it does align pretty well with what we know already. Flora had passed away when her mansion was set on fire, and with her last bits of magical energy, she was able to use that fire like a barrier, letting Shurike and the others escape. Upon her passing, she told Shurike that they would meet once more in her dreams. Now, we know that dreams themselves are a way to connect multiple consciousness together, and while you are asleep, you are more in tune to the astral world. 
Messages were able to be sent to all of mankind via dreams, giving them a premonition of Griffith's arrival to the world. Also, the Pontiff of the Holy See received a specific vision of what Griffith represented. So, dreams in general grant people closer connection into the spiritual realm. Flora did die, but here in the world of dreams, she is able to interact, and truly interact, with Shurike once again using fire as a barrier to protect them. Also, de-aging to a much younger version of herself, probably an image of when she was at her most powerful many years ago. So, what can you say? That this is perhaps Flora's spirit or soul? Or maybe a lingering bit of energy that she saved up upon her death specifically for this moment? Whatever the case may be, Flora allows the girls to get to the demon child encased inside of a womb of thorns. And we see it in its original ugly fetus-like form, which we haven't seen for quite some time. Reaching forward to touch the baby, representing the final fragment of memory, Shurike and Fernice are caught in a whirlwind of memories. The entire eclipse flashing before them, ready to sweep them up in its torment at any moment. Everything is on display, and the horrifying truth is given, as Farnese even sees what Casca saw the moment that her mind broke into pieces. That image of Guts screaming out for her, pinned down by an apostle. And that moment, the child transforms into a heart which is still wrapped in thorns. And Shurike immediately notices that this is something not good and likens it to a curse. Casca's sanity and her memories are unable to coincide for a reason, the immense pain that it would give her. Remember, all this is about her body protecting itself, and this is not about flipping a magic switch and having Casca go from potato to normal in a moment. I also think the symbolism here is pretty obvious, protecting her heart. They can bring back her mind, but from a symbolic point of view, a broken mind and a broken heart are slightly different. A broken mind gets rid of who you are as a person, but you can still feel the emotional spectrum and even happiness. A broken heart brings nothing but despair. Clearly the heart and the child are linked, and I also think it does have to do with guts. The protection here, I think, is stopping Casca from realizing, one, that the child and Griffith are sharing a body, or that Griffith was responsible for corrupting the child to begin with, and the second is that Guts, in his moment of weakness, also violated Casca once. These are the things that I believe will continue to be locked away, for now. She will have to face these truths as she recovers outside of the dream world. Now, this is just my opinion and my interpretation. You may think differently, and I could definitely be wrong, but I definitely think the thorns protecting the heart directly relate to both the child and to Guts in different ways. But as the Kaiju Femto begins to descend, they don't have time to question what to do about the thorns, and Farnese is the one who makes the decision. And to briefly reflect on her history, Farnese coming from a noble family that ignored her and left her to her own devices, all she wanted was the attention and acceptance from the adults, and through that she never found her own identity. She only did what would allow her to receive the most praise, until Guts showed her the truth of the world that she had no idea existed, and the value of standing up and fighting for yourself. To instead of using your hands to pray, to use them to pick up the torch and keep the darkness away yourself. Farnese has far and away the most character development out of any character in Berserk except for Guts himself, and she is the one to decide to complete the mission, to bring Casca back whatever the cost. She places the heart inside of the Casca doll and gives a farewell to the Chibi Casca, representing the departure of Casca's potato self, and allowing the real Casca back into the physical world to open her eyes from this long nightmare. Casca, the brave and beautiful warrior and best girl of Berserk, finally awakens, looking up at the fantastical surroundings of the inner workings of the spirit tree. And after only one day on Elfhelm, months inside the dream world, and 22 years in real world time, she finally comes back to us in the story. Also, fun fact, the chapter where we first see Casca lost her mind was called Awakening from a Nightmare, whereas this chapter, directly after the Nightmare of the Dreamscape, is just called Awakening. But, she speaks actual lines of dialogue 
thanking those around her and assuring her she remembers everything as her time as Elaine, the name that Luca gave her to represent the broken Casca. They ask her about her memories and Casca mentions that right now that things are very muddled. And as for the traumatic past, she can only remember up to setting out to rescue Griffith from the dungeon, meaning quite a large gap is currently missing. But instead of making her dwell on it, Farnese mentions Guts, which brings Casca to joyful tears, and she wishes to reunite with him. Denon uses her magic to give Casca an Elfhelm style dress, and we get a great callback with Casca feeling awkward dressing in a very feminine way since she's used to being in armor and being a warrior. Danan reaches out to Guts telepathically to meet at the entrance of the tree, and as Casca makes her way out, her memories like bubbles come flooding into her. Her life as Casca of the Band of the Hawk, and as Elaine the companion of Guts' group all flow together, like two lives of two different people meeting in the middle. And in the middle of all that, Casca feels a calling that there is someone that she wants to see. This is the true reunion that we have been waiting for. Some for literally 22 years. Guts is seen in the distance, and Farnese, Shurke, and Danon all wait in the distance allowing for Guts and Casca to see each other once more. When Casca sees him, she calls out and begins to walk towards him, but... In typical Berserk fashion, nothing is as pleasant as it seems. Upon looking at Guts, it triggers more memories and Casca to come to the surface. Flashes of both Griffith and his dungeon cell, and the surroundings of the eclipse with Guts in the center. It would seem that the remaining memories of Casca are brought out upon seeing Guts. Guts is after all more of a link to those events than anything else. The Berserker armor may also play a part in just the visual imagery of it, representing the darkness within him. Whatever the case, Casca still has issues that need to be resolved, and she collapses to the ground as this chapter ends. We are left with this. We have a fully functioning, walking, talking Casca. Casca, the character, is back. She knows who she is and she's able to communicate and even fight. This was the goal of the Corridor of Dreams. We have the character of Casca back in the story, and that in itself is an absolute win. What we do not have is a complete reset of events of the Eclipse, and this is a good thing. If trauma could be fixed with magic, I think it would defeat the purpose of many of the core themes of Berserk. Berserk is largely about the internal struggle of being a human being, our sadness, darkness, and ability to move forward in spite of horrific events that are outside of our control. Guts was allowed to have his development as Black Swordsman to now, and is still invested in the struggle. Casca will have to learn to push forward in spite of her trauma and metaphorically be able to lift the thorns from her heart. And this cannot be done through magic. This has to be done as a human and making hard choices while accepting harmful realities. Even though Berserk is wild with demons and monsters and big penis creatures, its core fundamentals, at least to me, deal heavily with true human issues we face on the internal side. Casca will never be exactly who she was before. As Guts has stated, even if you piece back what was lost, it's not going to be the same. Casca must press forward and develop as a person, as all of our other characters have. And now she is here in the story to be able to do that, rather than just being a potato self. And I for one, despite the hiatus, am very excited to see where Casca will go. And I know that someday, she will be able to look at Guts. Not the same way she did before, but still, without a doubt, with absolute love in her heart. Love for her protector, and the man who risked everything to bring her back. So the last time Guts and Casca were together as a couple was shortly before the event that would change their lives forever. The horrendous, demon-infested eclipse, in which would cost Guts an arm and an eye, and would cost Casca the violation of her very body and the loss of her sense of self, causing her to sink into a deep state of regression, for which would last 27 volumes worth of content and 22 years in our real time. The last few chapters focused heavily on the revival of Casca's mental state, traveling to the magical realm of Elfhelm, meeting dozens of new colorful characters including the Flower Storm Monarch Danan, 
the ruler of the island and practitioner in the healing magics, such as the Corridor of Dreams. Shurike and Farnese put their training to the test as they entered the dark and desolate landscapes of Casca's tormented psyche, unlocking deeply hidden memories and gaining a full understanding of what exactly Casca and even Guts went through to get them to this point. Miraculously, against all odds, Farnese being the one to make the final decision on the matter, they were able to restore Casca's mind, her eyes opening in the real world, bringing with her the lost sense of self that had been sleeping within her for so long. It was one of the most glorious and satisfying moments in the entire manga, and what needed to come next was, of course, the long-awaited reunion between Guts and Casca, having them actually be able to speak to one another. As Casca is given a beautiful new dress and awaits outside the giant spirit tree for her protector, the first glimpse of Guts has more memories flood into her mind of that fateful day causing her to scream in terror envisioning the brutal truth of what she had experienced. The chapter ends, and fans awaited the next chapter with anticipation, as they wondered what would happen next. Would Casca awake in Guts' arms as he tries to comfort her? Would Guts be struck with fear and confusion himself? Will Casca be able to speak out about her assault? There were so many questions. Everything had built to this moment, and then... The next chapter cuts to something completely different, and we get to see a bunch of giants! Yay! This is what everybody secretly really wanted. Big monstrous creatures that dressed with the bones of humans that they had killed, using shields as kneecaps, and my favorite is this guy with a boat on top of his head wielding a swinging anchor like a chain scythe. That's pretty awesome. But who could these big boys be going up against? That's right, it can only mean one thing. Yes, boys and girls, we got ourselves some Griffith chapters. And there was much rejoicing. Okay, in Miura's defense, ever since the beginning of the Millennium Empire arc, he has taken the narrative to switch between the Guts story and the Griffith story. This was commonplace in the Millennium Empire, where we would see chapters showcasing Griffith rebuilding the Band of the Hawk and fighting against the Kushan until his inevitable victory against Ganeshka. Even the Fantasia arc has already had one break to go to the Griffith side of things. Only that break showcased Ricker as our main character arriving in Falconia, and even though it wasn't from Griffith's perspective, it was still showing us exactly what life is like now both in the world at large and within the royal city. We saw how the world had been overrun with monsters, and living outside Falconia is a desperate struggle for survival against them. However, within the walls of the city, people are safe, work in harmony, and praise their messiah, showing them literal proof of the afterlife, and letting them say goodbye to their loved ones. So, despite seeing very little of Griffith, we still got a good sense of how things are running. Well, now we're going to see what else Griffith is actually doing, other than just sitting in luxury and banging Princess Charlotte on the regular. Which apparently isn't happening as often as it would be if I was with Charlotte, but that's another story. Anyway, first we have to see what Griffith and his army are going to do against these giants, which are actually called the Jotun, which comes from Old Norse mythology, though not specifically speaking of giants, more so something meant to describe a being being exceedingly beautiful or exceedingly grotesque. And I don't know about you, but Boatman is pretty beautiful to me. So who did Griffith bring to fight these guys? Well, he's got a bunch of no-name apostles, some human knights, Grunbelt is here, that's cool I guess, he should have died a long time ago if you ask me, but I think we all know who really matters here. MOTHERFUCKING ZOD! So the two forces charge at each other, and it's a pretty entertaining battle that ensues. We see that Sir Laban is here, and Mule is fighting as well. Sonia is also here doing what she does best, using her medium abilities to warn the soldiers of oncoming threats mid-battle. Look, if there's one thing Griffith was an absolute master of back in his human days, it was battle strategy during war. In here as a god hand in disguise, and for all intents and purposes, a king of the people, he's exactly who you would want to have leading you in a battle against the giants. But the Jotun seem to have more intelligence than the average astral monster. The leader looks like fucking Conan of the Giants, and also, is that a dinosaur skull behind him? Please, Miura, for the love of all that is holy, please let me see some dinosaurs in Berserk at some point. That would be amazing. 
But anyway, the Jotun leader also has trolls on leashes, which is pretty awesome, and even commands a Hydra, which if we're going by size scaling here, the Hydra is about three times taller than the Jotun, so this thing is absolutely massive. I mean, it's not quite Sea God Shiva form Ganishka size, but way bigger than the usual astral creatures we see in the story. So who has got the balls to take on this Hydra? Say it with me one more time, you guys. Mother fucking Zod! Oh, also Irvine and Grunbell jump in. I guess you could consider them Griffith's A team. And with the three of them working together, literally the Hydra turns out to be no threat at all. It's teamwork. Griffith also uses Grunbell's size as cover, runs up his back, and delivers the killing blow to the Jutun leader right in his eye. Come to think of it, Griffith has always enjoyed this eye kill, hasn't he? Griffith stands victorious in this absolutely amazing double page spread of art. So the abrupt shift to the Griffith chapters portion is off to an intense start. And really it's similar to the formula of the Millennium Empire arc, but why was this cutaway so bothersome to so many people? Was it just because fans were expecting the Guts Casca reunion right away? Well, Miura has plenty of times giving you things you didn't expect and wound up tying it all in later. I think the true enemy here is, of course, the hiatus. There was a pretty consistent flow of chapters regarding Casca's revival back in 2018. In fact, these two chapters came out the following months after. But after that, it was from August 2018 until April 2019 before another chapter was released. Eight months of wait, and when it returned, we were still in the Griffith chapters portion. Now, three Griffith chapters while reading consecutively, especially when the first one is all action with barely any dialogue, isn't that bad. And then, minor spoiler for upcoming chapters if you aren't cut up, it cuts back to Guts and Casca after that. We still don't get a reunion per se, but it's only a three chapter gap. But it was also a 17 month gap in real time. The gaps between chapters is what's frustrating people and what gives the illusion that the Fantasia arc is weak. But there are actually a lot of amazing things happening in this arc, it's just that people forget and begin to not care over time. Let me give you an example. So if you started high school when Guts landed on Elfhelm, you would be in your second year of college right now. Or if you didn't go to college like me, maybe you'd be wasting your 20s trying to get laid. Whatever the case, a lot of time has happened in the real world as we wait for chapters. But you know, maybe it's all meant to be a meta thing. We know that time moves faster on the outside of Elfhelm, so maybe Miura is trolling us all and giving us an example of how much time is happening in the real world while Guts and company are on Elfhelm. I will seriously laugh my ass off if he decides that the time gap is going to be the same exact amount of time that the manga was focused on the island. Uh, to that, I would say, bravo Miura, you're a genius. But anyway, back to the story. Griffith asks Sonya to send a telepathic image of his victory to everyone that's involved. Oh, and if you're wondering why astral monsters are fighting against Griffith, well, there's a definite difference between them and, let's say, apostles. Apostles are subservient to the god hand, or at least unable to truly oppose them. Ganishka tried with all of his might and was still brought to his knees. Astral creatures, on the other hand, were brought into being by being manifestations of humanity's fears and insecurities. Because rumors and terror circulate in the minds of mankind, the monsters continue to exist. But now those monsters are brought into the physical, real world. So they have no concept or obedience to the god hand, who were at one point human. But as the conversation after the battle seems to imply, Griffith was attempting to take back even more territory outside the walls of Falconia. So the question is now, for what purpose? Well, the answer can lie in the Stonehenge-inspired backdrop. By the way, Guts once rested here back in the Conviction Arc. Which makes me really wish that Miura would come up with a map of the Berserk landscape. I think that would be really useful to a lot of fans. But anyway, by reassembling the stones, Griffith essentially recreates something that most likely was here a thousand years ago during Geyseric's reign. And this is a way to instantly transport from one location to the other. The stones kind of act as a magical gateway that connect to the branches of the world tree. 
The world tree is the thing linking the physical and astral worlds together, but its branches now traverse the sky, and they can actually be used kind of like a wormhole for transportation. Instantly, the entire military group flies across the sky, arriving safely back in Falconia. And we have actually seen this used once before. When the Moonlight Boy last left Guts and Company, it left by means of one of these branches. But there are some limitations, because Sonya mentions that regular people can't use them without the help of a divine being like Griffith, or a medium such as herself. It's just another thing that gives her something that only her and Griffith can do together. And if her fangirling wasn't enough, this very telling bit of dialogue where Sonya says that she would race to the ends of the earth if Griffith called. Hmm, ends of the earth. Elf helm? Eh, we'll get to that. Next, we get a nice dose of politics. Griffith sits with his council, which looks to consist of Locust, Laban, Owen, who did not get a haircut. Whatever, he's still a champ. Oh, and look, Minister Foss is here, still in a position of importance. He owes a lot to Griffith, who once spared his life after an assassination attempt. No hard feelings, I'm sure. They speak about how the numerous people and different kinds of people entering the city at an alarming rate are causing some conflict between the citizens. Which makes sense, imagine all different people from all different walks of life being herded into a cage. I mean, into a sanctuary. Well, it may be too soon to see the intent Miura has for all this, but remember the Tower of Conviction and the mass collection of people, and their negative energy manifesting into a blob of restless souls that eventually crashed the whole thing down and gave way to Griffith's incarnation? If there is indeed more sinister purpose here in store for the residents of Falconia, this could all be part of the plan, and the easy pass of the beam to escape that only Griffith can really use might all be connected. Princess Charlotte is also here on the council promoting orphanages and education for lost children and commoners to which the nobles, used to dealing with this sort of thing, reject as an impossibility considering their funding. But Griffith sticks up for his woman, which is pretty cool, and tells them to do it anyway and that it's better to continue to thrive with people realizing the support of the government. What I get out of this is simply, it's kind of like indoctrination. You want everyone, no matter how poor or unequipped, to be willing to die for your nation or at least believe it's the best place on earth. As well, the more you rely on the government, the more power it gives them. It's all politics, man. And Guts would seriously be rolling his eyes at this point. The next thing Griffith talks about is including refugees into the ranks of military and construction, giving everybody a purpose and trying to keep everybody on the same path. That of expanding and empowering the glory of Falconia. He's even creating long highways that would lead to the city, wants to create bases outside of it, and even mentions building a second empire. Like every great warlord in history, it appears that Griffith is attempting a global domination. And just like Gut said in previous chapters, that's who Griffith is deep down. He will keep soaring higher and higher no matter the situation. Griffith can even use the astral monsters to his benefit as they are out there destroying all of civilization, and then Griffith can come in, wipe out the monsters, and continue to build, and look like a hero while doing it. And it's actually pretty genius. After the meeting, Mule and Sonya wait for Griffith. Sonya begins to go to him, but Charlotte gets there first in an epic cockblock. Charlotte thanks Griffith for sticking up for her and spouts that he is the father of this kingdom, like a king. But remember, the pontiff has yet to officially marry Griffith and Charlotte. What the hell he's waiting for, I'm not sure. The old dude could probably die any second. But Griffith isn't technically the king yet. But anyway, Charlotte tells Griffith she'll be going to her room to relax with some tea. And every man knows that when a girl says she's going to her room for some tea, what she really means is she wants to go to her room and get the D. Sonya tries to stop them by saying that they should all hang out together, but Mule pulls her away, doing Griffith a solid so that he can go have some alone time. Sadly, this time we do not get to see Griffith take Charlotte to Pound Town, but the aftermath has her out like a light, similar to last time, and though we don't know if Griffith thought about Guts the entire time like he did when he was human, we perhaps get the most telling moment ever with Griffith at the windowsill. Griffith sits looking at his hair, which is normally drawn pure white, but this image specifically has dark strands of black hair. Griffith has inner monologue that we almost never see. The most rare thing in Berserk, besides consistent chapter releases, is being able to read what happens in Griffith's head. And he thinks that, again, this will be the night. 
and then disappears from the windowsill. Now look, I have reviewed every single chapter since this one individually. This is the chapter where I caught up to Berserk for the first time when I was reading it. And you know, this manga analysis series has been one of the most fun things that I've ever done on this channel. But I'm at a bit of a crossroads as to how to continue it from here. To talk about the ending of this chapter, I have to talk about spoilers for the five chapters that have been released after this. And good lord, there's only been five Berserk chapters since I got into it. Anyway, what we can assume this is confirming is that yes, Griffith and the Moonlight Boy do share a body. Griffith looking at his hair turning black, saying again, confirms it enough, but five chapters from now, spoiler, the Moonlight Boy shows up on Elfhelm, most likely getting there through the World Tree branches. You can't get more clear cut than that until Griffith states it verbally, I mean come on. The question will be, will Sonya follow him? Griffith can use the World Tree branches to travel across the globe. If he goes to Elfhelm as the boy, will Sonya follow, and will she bring reinforcements? And that's kind of my theory anyway. But like I said, I'm at a bit of a crossroads as to how to continue the manga analysis series now, since I have already reviewed the remaining chapters. Now, I could just do an analysis video of the remaining chapters and have this YouTube series be all up to date, or I could wait until volume 41 comes out and begin to do the analysis series volume by volume for the rest of Berserk's run. This would make it a lot easier to do and give me good chunks of chapters to put out. But this would also mean you would only get a new video in the series probably every two to three years. But it would be easy enough to stay on track and continue. I, I don't know. You guys let me know in the comments. Do you want one more manga analysis to catch up with all the chapters? or wait and do the analysis series from now on, volume by volume, for more content. You guys tell me in the comments below. But I do want to say thank you so, so, so much for watching all of these videos. I had like 300 subscribers when I began to do this series, and now I'm at 56,000. It's been a few years, and I know that this is one of the main reasons that you guys stuck around and helped me get this far. I hope that even if this analysis series needs to be put on hiatus itself, that you continue to stick around to my channel and check out my other content. I love Berserk, it's not just my favorite manga series, but my favorite fictional story of all time. But I also have lots of other interests. I review other manga, anime, movies, and have other content to bring you guys. I really truly appreciate any of the support that you give me, but I hope if this series pauses you will still give me a chance in other endeavors and other videos. Also, if you want to support me or the channel growth, I do have a merch store linked down in the description of this video. You can literally get yourself a motherfucking Zod t-shirt, hoodie, or mug, along with lots of other cool designs and items. I also have a Patreon with various tiers and perks attached to them that you can check out. And besides that, just like and comment on the videos to help in the algorithm and subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Thank you again guys for coming along with me on this journey. I really, really do appreciate each and every one of you. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. And I'll talk to you soon. Hello everybody. In my last video I did in the manga analysis series, I asked you guys whether or not I should do one more to wrap up the remaining five chapters, or if I should just wait for more to come out and start doing the series volume by volume. The tragic irony of that question being, just a few weeks later we received the devastating news that Sensei Kentaro Miura had passed away. This is something that many fans have worried about for a while now, and considering how long Berserk has been going on for and knowing full well that Miura was only getting older, but even though in his later years the man had been taking care of his health, tragedy still strikes life is the most unkind at our best times. Little is known to the public about Miura's personal life, but most comment on his reclusiveness and how he often keeps to himself, and to my knowledge, he never had a wife or children to pass down his legacy to. This is a brutal reminder of the fragility of life, and I think it's important to use moments like this that bring us down and make us double take what exactly we are doing in our own lives. I won't pretend to know what Miura was like or what he wanted out of life, but when thinking about my own, it reminds me that I need to use each day to build and work on achieving my goals, and that we never know just how much time we have, and so we need to live as authentically as possible. 
For me, I am still sort of new to Berserk in comparison to how long the story has been around. My first experience with Berserk were the anime trilogy of films that I decided to watch on Netflix one night. And after being thoroughly traumatized by the third film and the Eclipse, especially not knowing anything that was going to happen, it was inevitable that I would have to get into the manga. And as silly as it sounds, reading this manga, it changed my life in a lot of ways. Looking at the themes of struggling, enduring, pushing past horrible situations and inner turmoil, how to overcome and how to press on in spite of the darkest things that have happened to you, and Guts as a main character is far beyond anything that I've ever read or experienced before. How flawed he is, how trauma affects him and destroys him, how he makes mistakes, and how hard he tries to continue moving forward in spite of them. His search for his own purpose and dream in the midst of being underneath another, his beast of darkness representing the darkest aspects of his psyche, and just how powerful and negative that energy can be. His love for Casca and valuing who she is and convicting himself to never lose her again. On top of that, taking place in a dark, cruel, and ruthless world that takes no prisoners, and a story that doesn't shy away from the harsh topics and ideas, and is allowed to express them in an artistic way. Sometimes in a sickening way, other times in a beautiful way. This story infiltrated my mind and is something I hold very close to my heart, and I have nothing but absolute gratitude and admiration for Kentaro Miura for creating it. I uploaded my first Berserk analysis video on October 18th of 2018. That video, which I cannot watch to this day due to how poorly constructed it is, how awful the audio is, and how it was so unscripted that I just sound terrible and all over the place. Honestly, I've thought about deleting it more than a dozen times. And perhaps there will be a day where I do a remake of it in some way, but I decided to keep it up because this was the start of my journey of talking about this series on YouTube and what helped me garner a little bit of recognition among the community. For those of you that don't know, I never set out to make a Berserk channel or a manga anime channel for that matter. I never considered myself an anti-tuber or whatever you would like to call it. See, I've had various YouTube channels throughout my life, and I usually use them to upload movie reviews, skits that I would write and direct, or just whatever else that I wanted. Real Life Ryan, this channel, was originally just a vlog channel for random content, but when I deleted all my other channels, I just decided to use this one to post everything in one place. Part of my motivation for creating the analysis series, well... One, I didn't really have anybody to talk to about Berserk in my real life, so I figured I'd just talk about it on the internet and maybe find some more people that were interested in it. I wasn't aware of how popular Berserk was or if it was considered the best manga of all time. None of that factored into my decision. I just watched this on my own, read it on my own, and wanted to talk about it. I kind of learned about the legacy of Berserk after the fact. Uh, with creating the manga analysis series specifically, I was also inspired by Mystere Fusion's Dragon Ball Dissection series. If you don't know who that is, he has a YouTube channel where he basically goes through all of Dragon Ball from the very beginning, sort of analyzing it, breaking it down. And I thought, has anyone ever done this for Berserk? Has anyone ever gone from start to finish analyzing the entire thing? And I remember I specifically searched through YouTube as much as I could to try to make sure that nobody had done this yet. I didn't want to copy anybody. And fortunately, I didn't find any, and thus I decided to start the manga analysis series. As well in this video, we have made it up to chapter 359, and 359 is actually really special to me as well. It was the first Berserk chapter to come out after I had become a Berserk fan, and chapter 359 was the beginning of me gaining subscribers on YouTube. Because for whatever reason, I think it was because I had off from work the day that it dropped, I'm not sure, but I know for a fact I was the first person on YouTube to review chapter 359. And this was my biggest break when it comes to getting found on YouTube. I think I had maybe 300 subscribers when I uploaded my review for that chapter, and five months after I uploaded that review, I hit my first 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, which to this day I think is still the most momentous victory that I've had. Considering how many YouTube channels I've had, how hard it was to even get past 200, 300, 400, like it's such a difficult journey to get to 1,000, that big 1K number just really, really sparked my motivation of the fact that 
I think I could probably do this. I could put a ton of effort into this and maybe make something out of it. And so, uh, yeah, I really have Berserk to thank and a lot of respects for that. Now, talking about chapter 359 in itself, it is also a remarkable chapter just within the contents. In this chapter, we come back to Elfhelm with a little bit of a skip from where we last left Casca and Guts going to meet one another. Casca is given a haircut back to her more traditional look and given an Elfhelm style fighting outfit and sword. Everyone, of course, is stunned at the pure, immaculate beauty of our dark skinned goddess. Oh, Casca. But the really special thing is seeing Casca not just looking how she used to, but truly speaking lines of dialogue and interacting with the other characters. Because even though Casca has technically been with the group this entire time, she wasn't fully Casca until now. And it's just such a rewarding thing to see and read. Isidro recounts all that they've been through, saying how long of a journey it's felt like, to which Puck breaks the fourth wall, saying it feels like 20 years, which, even though I don't normally like fourth wall breaks, that one's pretty funny. Casca thanking Farnese for being like a big sister to her is also especially nice to see. Both have had so much to be thankful for in one another, as without Casca, Farnese wouldn't have felt that sense of purpose within the group that she has now, and we know it was Farnese who placed the protected heart back within the Casca doll inside the dreamscape, which fully allowed her mind to be restored. Casca then wishes to test how rusty she's become as a swordsman, and Danan brings out some golems for her to battle that are basically just controlled suits of armor from Vikings, as she says, Vikings, that have come to the island many years prior. Knowing how time moves differently on the island, it could perhaps be hundreds of years that these Vikings existed in the Berserk universe. I wonder if they landed here thinking it was Vinland and were in for a rude surprise. Anyway, Casca showcases her skills and she royally fucks them up, solidifying that we have a full, walking, talking, fighting capable Casca back in the story. It's awesome. Even Isidro asks her to help train him. We then see Guts behind a tree in the distance, letting himself be hidden from the viewpoint of Casca as his mere appearance caused her to experience some sort of panic attack. When talking to him about it, I love Danan's comments about how it's up to Casca now, that she will have to face it in time and within time allow herself to heal. And I think that's great because like I said in the Dreamscape video, it's not like a magic switch to make everything better. Berserk deals a lot in the ideas of working through past trauma and wounds and being able to overcome them each in their own way. Farnese, desperate to make the Guts Casca reunion happen, not as desperate as we the audience are, but pretty close. Farnese acting selflessly in looking past her own feelings and wanting them both just to be happy. A far cry from the heretic burning Farnese that we once knew. She brings Casca over to try again, and even though Guts is on the other side of the tree, and they can't see each other, she does begin to speak to him, something that we haven't seen in so long in the manga. But it isn't like Miura to keep us happy for too long, as she comments on Isidro reminding her a little bit of Judo, even speaking his name, Eclipse flashbacks flash into her mind, causing her to go into another panic attack. And as Guts comes around the corner to comfort her, just the mere sight of him breaks her down even more, and we see Guts' pain and turmoil, wanting so badly to help, to speak to her, to hold her, and even now, as she is restored, he still cannot be with her the way that he wants to. He clenches his teeth and walks away as she falls into the fetal position. Now, when Casca looks up at Guts, there's a panel of him surrounded by Eclipse-like demons. I don't know if this is the reason, but I feel like the unresolved issue of Guts' physical assault on Casca back when they were traveling together, when Guts was heavily exhausted, sleep-deprived, frustrated, and depressed, he briefly gave in to the darkness within himself. It happened when Casca was in a childlike state of mind, he would have began to associate Guts with the very demons that attacked her. Seeing Guts as he is, and maybe even with the Berserker armor adding to it, it's a reflective association with the demons from a subconscious level. Casca knows that Guts cares for her, but the subconscious can be even stronger. And if anyone has ever dealt with panic attacks out there in real life, you know that rational thought cannot always trump the physical emotion. Our bodies act in spite of our minds sometimes, and it feels like we're just along for the ride. The next chapter shows Casca waking up alongside Farnese, Shurikei, and Dinan. She has an interesting bit of dialogue, and I hope the translation is correct. Because when she says something reminds her of the old days, that she's dragged back to that place and that time, I would have to believe that she is talking about the eclipse itself. 
In a few chapters prior, she said that she remembered going to rescue Griffith from the dungeon, and after that it all got foggy. So I think we are meant to assume that as she has these attacks that she gets from these triggering memories of the past, that she is remembering further and further. So I would say that this chapter leads me to believe that she does in fact remember the eclipse now, but of the specific details, specifically the part with Femto, I'm not sure. It's probably left deliberately vague so we as the audience can kind of piece it together. Danan puts Casca to sleep so that she can rest, and as the girls leave, Casca is still gripping onto Farnese, much like she would have in her regressed state. Farnese has become much like a security blanket for Casca, again dealing with her subconscious. Even now, she wants to cling to her. Farnese in this chapter also gets much time to shine, going out with Shiriki to display her skills in front of dozens of students of magic and even Genfring himself. She demonstrates her ability to connect to the four elemental kings, and apparently this is usually done with a magic circle? Since she can do it without one, I guess that makes her the full metal witch. Uh, I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. When Gedfring asks her how long she's been practicing, she says three months, and this is actually the first bit of information that we've gotten on Berserk's timeline in quite a while, because she first asked to be taught on the beach before the crew entered Vertanis. So that means that all the events of the city and the entire boat trip only accounts for three months worth of time, which honestly, I would have thought a lot longer than that, but it is good to get some context about how much time has passed in the story. Shirake as well demonstrates her ability and summons a darker spirit from a nearby tree, a spirit that nobody else even was able to sense was there, and offers it an apple of one of the students. Poor kid losing his apple just like that because Shirake wants to show off. What the hell? Shirake didn't even ask him. But the idea here is that the real world and battle experience that Shirake and Farnese have gone through have gotten them to a level that is beyond the students here to specifically train in magic but things are much different on an island of peace than they would be in a world filled with real danger. We also learn a few new things, that Danan can also help to heal someone's soul. Particularly, this is meant for Casca, but we don't have a clear idea of what this information really means. Is it another dreamscape-like process, or is Danan a licensed therapist that Casca is going to have to see three times a month? Probably something I should do. We just don't know yet, but after what we went through, I couldn't imagine Mira doing a similar process to heal her even more, and like Danan said earlier, the ability to heal is pretty much up to Casca now, so only time would have told what a healing process like this would have been like. Gedfring also mentions to Shirake the existence of beings called demons. In Berserk lore, it appears the daemon are spirits that were human and can still assist even after their life has ended, just the same way that Flora assisted Shirake within the dreamscape. I don't want to be too cynical here, but if they're setting up the idea that a magic user who dies can still aid after their death, and showcasing just how powerful Shuriken and Farnese have become, could it be that if a main character were to die, it would be one of them? And if she is also connected to Casca in some deep way, look, I don't want Farnese to die. I don't want Farnese to die at all, alright? I'm just saying that her death would have an incredible impact on the cast as a whole. Shirake, Casca, Guts, Serpico, even my boy Roderick, they all are connected to Farnese in various ways, in different ways, that would tear their relationships apart if she were to die. But aside from that, poor Guts walked all the way to the edge of the island, swinging a sword as he feels, well, useless. He's absolutely powerless to do anything to help Casca beyond this point, and as a man who has the drive to protect her and a ton of physical power, here he is in a situation where he can do nothing and sneaking up behind him is the character not seen since his absolute fuck-up in attempt to kill Femto on top of Ganeshka, Skull Knight finally appears back in the manga, making his debut within the Fantasia arc. Having made his way to the island, and telling Guts that he bears witness to the end of his journey, and that that is not always a happy thing. Doing what you need to do, or completing what you need to, doesn't always mean that there will be satisfaction, and as he warned before, her wish may not be his wish. But this reunion of characters is almost as interesting as the Guts Casca reunion, because the last time Skull Knight and Guts spoke was again on the beach before they went to Vertanis, where Skull Knight warned Guts of continued use of the Berserker armor and how he would begin to lose his senses and succumb to it and its darkness completely. But Guts mentioned that he made it here in one piece and was able to avoid all that. As Skull Knight rebuttals, causality has yet to converge. Gedfring then arrives, calling Skull Knight Majesty in front of him, 
all but confirming yet again that Skull Knight was King Geyseric, whom lost his kingdom a thousand years ago. And even Skull Knight recognizes Gedfring as the son of Vid. This could also be a little too on the nose, or lack thereof a nose, but if it is true that the God Hand member Void was a sage and magic user under Geyseric back when Geyseric ruled the city, which is now Falconia, and that if Void was a magic user that his son would have been as well, so this leaves the theory open that Gedfring, who is perhaps, besides Denan, assumed to be the most powerful person on this island, it would fall in line that he had a powerful teacher in his father, who eventually became a god hand, but this is still all unconfirmed. Gedfring suggests to both of them that they go see someone called Hanar, a dwarf who forged both the Berserker armor and the armor that Skull Knight is wearing. Now this is a ton of information, which is why I don't get when people say current Berserk chapters aren't good. I'm only two and a half chapters in in this video, and we have Casca back, her memories returning, the introduction of Daemons, the return of Skull Knight, a possible connection to the God Hand in Gedfring, and now the creator of the Berserker armor and whatever Skull Knight spirit is being carried around in. This is insane. This is a ton of information. And to top it all off, we get Morda. Who decides to get in on the magic displaying and jumps on a broomstick with Shurike only to have them fly off together. Now when this chapter came out, I said this quote, and I stand by it to this day. Morda seems exceptionally skilled at riding, and uh, I'd like to let her know that I also have a broomstick available for her anytime that she wants. As they soar overhead, they see Gedfring, Guts, and Skull Knight from a distance and decide to follow them, taking them to an area far away from the main locations of the island, and a place where Morda mentions outcasts on the island live. She says that they're creatures that can't adapt to the light. And I would like to take this to mean that what's down here is not necessarily evil, nothing like the trolls or ogres that we've seen before, but even so, creatures that resonate more with the darkness. Maybe it can kind of be seen as a metaphor for the Berserker armor itself and the Beast of Darkness, something dark that has found a way to live and coincide with the light, a balance between the two, between light and dark that doesn't exist right now within the human world. There's also a storage of wicker men down here, which all was a part of the taboo magic that Morda used when the crew first arrived in the island. She even states that they are fueled with the sacrifices of soldiers that once attacked the island from the continents. I can only assume that this too maybe relates to King Geyseric when he first arrived to conquer the island. We also see a witch that is very interesting in Morda's master, who has the very classic fairy tale appearance of what you would think a witch to look like an old, decrepit woman with a long nose and a wart. She is very different from the usual witches that we have seen, even Flora, who was old but still looked very human and normal. Her name is Volvapa, and she deals in curses and manipulations of departed souls. It leads me to believe that this must be what witches used to look like, and maybe what they were before human involvement. Perhaps human magic users learned such things from these darker creatures on Elfhelm, and magic evolved eventually into what it is we see today. When we meet Hanar the dwarf, he is busy forging something else, and Guts is reminded of Godo, which I really like since Godo certainly made one of the biggest impacts on Guts' growth as a character, and it's good to get a call back to him and know that he's not forgotten. More intense revelations come out as Hanar greets Skull Knight as king, and confirms that the body Skull Knight has is a suit of armor made by him and that within that armor is whatever is left of Skull Knight's soul, more or less. We see in a few chapters that Skull Knight himself refers to his living self as just the remnants of a grudge, an idea of vengeance itself continuing on in pursuit of that one thing, and not a full human soul that's capable of experiencing all kinds of emotions. This is why Skull Knight is so cryptic and unfazed by anything. He is a walking, talking vessel of revenge, and nothing more at this point. He too lost his humanity, and we are about to see how. As Hanar turns to Guts and tells him he has yet to master the armor, and the armor is likely, as it did with Skull Knight, possess and consume the wearer like a host in a parasite, Hanar hits the armor to activate it, and the helmet comes slamming over Guts' head as we head into Chapter 362. Chapter 362. In the few short years that I have become a Berserk fan, Nothing has been like when Chapter 362 came out. The entire fandom was going nuts, and rightfully so. 
This is the chapter we had been waiting for for so long, and there's little to no dialogue in the entire thing. Hanar not only activated the armor, but triggered a blood memory that had been seeped into it. In other words, the final moments of Skull Knight's life. We get to see for the first time what caused the armor to take over Skull Knight, and seen through a POV style. Guts' vision literally seeing what Skull Knight saw upon his death. A vicious looking hellscape, similar yet very different than the eclipse that Guts experienced. Here the entire environment, instead of being made up of faces, are made up of squirming tentacles. And almost looking like they're being birthed from those tentacles, apostle-like monsters emerge. And from the POV shots, they are being chopped in half by the Skull Knight. The next panel is what blew everybody's mind. We get a shot of what is assumingly the God Hand, but there is only one that we recognize, Void standing in the center. As if this was his eclipse ceremony and he was the fifth God Hand. But how is this possible? Wasn't Void meant to be the first God Hand ever, and every 216 years another would rise until the completion of the fifth with Griffith? Well, this is a huge game changer in the story for many reasons. First of all, this is the first time we've seen Void in the story since the Golden Age Eclipse, so really cool and satisfying in itself just to see him here. And behind him we see four other characters that are assumingly four different members of the God Hand. And it can go along with the theory that time repeats itself like a cycle, and if this was a previous version, then Void would have the role similar to Griffith's in that he was the fifth God Hand of this cycle, and then, like Griffith, most likely was incarnated into the flesh at some point. As Skull Knight said to Guts in the Conviction arc, every 1,000 years a God Hand can be made flesh. So we might be seeing that repeated cycle where it was Void in Skull Knight's time and it's Griffith in our time. And perhaps the fifth God Hand of one cycle moves on to be the first in the next cycle. Now I have already made a deep dive video theory on the previous God Hand and all the different possibilities of what their existence could mean, so to get a better idea on my thoughts on it, please just go watch that video. Because I don't see the point of restating every single thing I said in that video in this video also, but for the sake of an analysis, I'll briefly state that this God Hand could be a couple of things. The first is that this is indeed a previous version to which Void was the fifth of this assortment. The first thing to look at is the appearance of them. Even though God Hand are demonic beings, the God Hand we know, Slan, Ubik, and Conrad, they all still look mostly human. But these old God Hand are very unmistakably monstrous. One explanation for this is that they represent a different era of mankind, an era where man and magic coincided. The God Hand that we are used to come from a world that was separated from magic almost entirely, and is a warring time of man and kingdoms. Also, remember the confusion when recounting the story of Geyseric's kingdom and how it fell. There were supposedly four or five angels that descended and destroyed the kingdom. Perhaps the confusion happened because there were five God Hand, once Void was created to become a part of them, but then magic users summoned the elemental kings, of which there are four of, and they had the power to wipe out the old God Hand, with the exception of Void who was the only survivor. But from there, Void had to rebuild the God Hand, manipulating fate and causality to find a chosen one every 216 years. And perhaps it's that powerful elemental magic that Void was determined to separate from mankind, turning a primitive, magical, perhaps polytheistic world into a rigid, strict, monotheistic world with only one true God and creating the Holy See, manipulating the consciousness of man to begin to hate and fear magic as evil and heresy, burning witches and heretics, and believing that they are doing the Lord's work by implementing very dark and brutal tortures, which would only perpetuate the pain of the souls in the afterlife, which in turn would only make the abyss stronger as a swirling vortex of torment for the deceased. Or something like that. Some like to theorize that Skull Knight killed the former God Hand, but I would say that this is highly unlikely. Since the only time Skull Knight could get to the God Hand is at big ceremony events like this, and we also saw him try to attack Void during Griffith's Eclipse, and he failed, and we know that he created the Sword of Actuation specifically to kill the God Hand, but only used it for the first time in Clipoth, and when he tried to use it against Femto, it was evaded and used against him to bring the world into Fantasia, so Skull Knight killing them, not likely in my opinion. Speaking of Skull Knight though, we are in his flashback, and we are seeing him hold a woman in his arms, who we also see has been branded. 
and as she passes out, we see the kingdom in flames behind her in the shape of the brand. This woman was most likely Geyserk's queen or lover, and at the loss of her and his entire kingdom, the rage of his own inner beast and the berserker armor would have taken over completely. I'd imagine within his wrath, he would have destroyed as much as he could until he bled out completely and was eventually killed while wearing the armor. Shirke helps to pull Guts out of this memory and back to his senses, and Skull Knight ends the chapter stating that what Guts saw was the end of a foolish king and the beginning of a dead man stalking the Endless Knight. As in, from that moment, Geyseric died, and whatever was left over was a pure form of hatred and revenge. The feelings and emotions he had upon his death became his only sense of emotion. Skull Knight is not a multi-dimensional person anymore, he is just a being that wants the God Hand dead. Not for any moral reasons, or because it's the right thing to do, but because that's all that he is left. Remember when Skull Knight saved Rickert from the Count and Rosine back in the Golden Age arc, but he didn't kill them? I never understood why he would just let them go. But I've thought about it, and I think that I understand that Skull Knight doesn't really care about Apostles. Not that he wouldn't kill them if they were in his way or if they were attacking him, but he is after the God Hand specifically, and whatever it takes to do just that. Anything else is just in his way as he tries to accomplish it. I also had another theory that Skull Knight saved Guts and Casca because he believed it would cause a rift in the timeline. Enough of a change that it might help him battle against the God Hand. If Guts represents who Skull Knight was as a man within the Eclipse and Skull Knight died during his, then saving Guts might make things go differently during this cycle. Just the same, keeping Casca alive, the person who made Geyseric go into his final rage that killed him, if Casca lives, Guts may not suffer the same fate as Skull Knight did. So you could say Skull Knight saved them for selfish reasons, but him saving them could have been the very key that will allow the God Hand to fall someday causing a mere splash in a gigantic ocean that could turn the tides. But now we get to chapter 363, and this is it guys, this is the final chapter of Berserk to have been released. I almost didn't even want to review it again for this video, because it cements the end for some time, but let's get to it. So Skull Knight goes to the gravesite of his fallen lover, which is here on the island, within the roots of the cherry tree that Danan resides. But Skull Knight goes to the grave more like a muscle memory or going through the motions. Imagine being at the grave of your lost lover, but you don't feel anything. This is what I imagine Skull Knight is like, looking at this stone to which he should feel a great deal of sadness, and yet he is completely blank. The really interesting part is when Shurike and Gut state that Skull Knight's lover looked almost like Danan, and yet the two of them don't seem to act as such. But they share a look, and to me, these are two characters living a current life that is far from who they used to be. This is my theory, that Danan is like a reincarnation of Skull Knight's lost lover. That upon their deaths, Flora, who would have been a part of their team, tried to save their souls. She put what she could of Geyseric's soul into the armor so he could continue his pursuit of vengeance, and she connected Danan's soul to the spirit tree, and she was reincarnated as a creature of magic perhaps having very foggy memories of her human days, but like Skull Knight, essentially a different being entirely now. When these two look at each other, it's like they can sense that they were close in another life, but one that is too far gone to clearly remember. But hey, that's just my theory. A Berserk Theory! Yes, we do learn that it was Flora who no doubt did, as Gedfring says that after the Eclipse, she performed a taboo and was exiled from the island. Respecting the balance of life and the separation of the physical and astral worlds is what part of being a witch is, so bringing someone back, even in the ways that she did, was probably deeply frowned upon. And now we know why Flora left the island and eventually found her own place near a spirit tree in the human world. And next we get... Uh, do I really have to talk about this again? Do I really have to talk about the Isidro antics again? We went from the intensity and high emotion of an Eclipse flashback and learning about all this Skull Knight lore, to Isidro lifting the trainee witch's robes and tying them around their heads. Pages and pages worth of his antics and he's just getting revenge because they beat him up or something and I, I just, I gotta be honest with you guys, I'm just not a fan of this kind of stuff. It, it's not that I don't want any humor in Berserk, but I'd rather it flow a little more naturally and I thought it was better when it was just Puck being the comic relief. 
This is just such a bizarre shift in tone from what we just got, and it really ruins the momentum of the storytelling, in my opinion. I mean, I guess it's kind of funny how he's distracted by Morta. I mean, I would be too. But the best part is when Isma, riding on the back of a Kelpie, uses the Kelpie to grab Isidro in its mouth. It's cool because of two reasons. The first is because we haven't seen Isma do much since getting to the island, and it's a nice reminder that she's around and a valuable member of the group with her marrow abilities. And it also shows that, hey look, a Kelpie, a creature that we have only known so far to be malicious, can actually be tamed and used for good. Makes you wonder what all of the astral creatures are only evil due to how humanity perceives them. The chapter wraps up with Guts and Gedfring having a brief discussion over Skull Knight, and even Gedfring saying that Skull Knight probably sees his former self in Guts a bit. And lastly, that seeing what happened to Skull Knight and his fury, it would be up to Guts to decide what to do with his. Guts looks to the hut, where inside Casca is awake speaking to Farnese, and it's as if Guts recounts what is special to him. Casca, many times stating her to be the flame that keeps his darkness in check, but also has a flash of Griffith. The source of all his pain and misery to begin with, and the quest of vengeance that he vowed so long ago. And thinking about both of these people that have had the strongest impact on his life, someone else approaches from the distance. And it's none other than the arrival of the Moonlight Boy, or who we as the audience know, shares a body with Griffith himself. Griffith is technically so close to Guts at this moment unbeknownst to him. The child that takes over during the full moon, traveling the World Tree branches to be here once again to see his parents. But on this island, with several highly skilled and intelligent magic users, will they be able to tell the true nature of what this boy is? And that, my friends, is a question that we may never have an answer to, as 363 ends on the cliffhanger of the boy's arrival. Again, I have made an entire theory video on what I think will happen next, the link to that will also be in the description. But yeah, we, uh, we made it guys. The analysis series has now covered every chapter of Berserk. Two and a half years in the making for you guys. And now that we have come to the end, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and supporting me and my channel as I made these. But more importantly, thank you for being Berserk fans and making this the greatest community that I have ever been a part of. Now, obviously, I will still be making Berserk content, monster manuals, theories, character stuff. I'd also like to find a way to go back through the series from Volume 1, but not really do a repeat of what I've already done. Maybe some live readings, or maybe a volume-by-volume -volume discussion with you guys in a live stream or something. I I'm not exactly sure yet, but I'll continue to brainstorm and figure it out. Other than that, thank you guys so much for being here. I couldn't have done it without you, or especially without Kentaro Miura. I have so much gratitude to everyone who has liked the videos, commented, all my subscribers, almost at 60k, it's, it's unbelievable. Let me know what other kind of Berserk content you would like to see, video ideas, anything you want. I want to give back to you guys as much as I can. And other than that, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and continue struggling, my fellow strugglers. Well, that time has finally come. What very well may be the final Berserk chapter, or at the very least, the final chapter worked on by Kentaro Miura himself. It has finally arrived. The day that the chapter dropped, I did do a live reaction to the chapter, reading it for the first time, and I will share that link down in the description if you'd like to read along with me. I had over a thousand people in that stream, which is unprecedented for me, and I absolutely appreciate everybody that decided to stop by. I've said it many times before, but Berserk is truly a masterpiece of a series, and I'm talking about beyond the world of just manga, but just in fiction and literature in general. The way Miura can convey the deepest parts of the human condition and translate that feeling of pain, trauma, regret, ambition, loyalty, and love, and encompass it within an exciting dark fantasy story filled with demons, sword fighting, and plenty of comedy, and pull it all together to a point where we have a literal world-destroying events that are at play at the moment, yet 99% of the fandom just wants our main character to be able to be happy and perhaps put down the sword for once in his life. Along with gorgeous artwork, it is a true testament to a master of the craft and a brilliant storyteller. As for me, 
my channel would not be what it is without Berserk because I just needed some outlet to talk about it. YouTube was my go-to thing and I'm internally grateful that you guys have enjoyed my takes and analysis on the series. And I figured as this chapter being the only outlier of the entire story from my manga analysis series that it deserved to be included even though I've never done one just for a single chapter. Now with 364 in general, this is an extremely wholesome chapter, however there are some concerning things things going on that I want to point out. But going in order, the first thing that we see happening is the Moonlight Boy who is now on the island jumping onto Gus's shoulders and Gus bringing him back to the hut where the rest of the crew is. Except for Roderick who is notably missing from this chapter. He's probably off being a chad somewhere. Freaking Roderick, he's so great. The small misdirect of Shirake thinking the boy might have been a form of Danan keeping an eye on them before they arrived at the island is of course debunked by Danan herself as she shows up in the hut as well, leaving the group's only knowledge of the boy being that they know that it loves to be around Casca. So Guts asks the others to take him to her. A kind gesture on the surface, yes, but also very sad when you think about it because it's the fact that Guts can't take the boy to see Casca himself. They are unable to see one another still without Casca having a traumatic flashback, so we still have this sense of distance and longing, which is actually another theme of the chapter. We also have the theme of family, as Danan mentions that the group has been accepted by the others, and how this ragtag team of misfits has become so close that you can, for all intents and purposes, call them a family hitting the nail on the head even further with the actual Moonlight Boy and Casca, and how she is delighted to see him and remembers him from her time in the Elaine state. Now this is the first time the restored Casca has seen the boy, and I was assuming that she would instinctively know that the boy was her child, and I still think deep down she does, but logically there's no way to justify it on the surface, so she doesn't come right out and suggest it. Only her subconscious reminds her a little bit later in the chapter. But this image of the boy and Casca snuggling up together is absolutely beautiful and when you remember that this is the piece of her heart that she was protecting so deeply within the dreamscape and here he is safely in her arms. Next we get a series of wholesome pages when waking up the next day we see that the boy is still here. And here's the interesting part, apparently time is moving quicker on the elf island and the full moon is still outside of the island. And this is the opposite of what we've been told before, like with the Peacock story. That within the elf dimension, time is still, and the outside world moves quicker. Well, here, apparently multiple days pass on the island, as only one night passes on the outside. At least, I think that's how it's being explained, but then again, I failed math, and also I'm having bad flashbacks to the hyperbolic time chamber from DBZ, and how the hell did Piccolo communicate telepathically to Goten and Trunks when he was outside of the time chamber and they were inside? Because wouldn't that take multiple days for his thoughts to be heard, and I don't know, whatever, moving on. The wholesome activity is great with them fishing and Casca running after the boy just to keep him safe. Kind of ironic since for so long Farnese and the others were taking care of Casca just as Casca is taking care of the boy now. But here's the concerning part for me and it's with Guts. Since Guts can't be around Casca, he goes off to train by himself and as he's swinging his sword, the sword flies out of his hands. He loses his grip on it and this is major. This is a huge red flag. We also see his vision being blurred once again, and it all comes back to the Berserker armor. The Berserker armor is an amazing tool and power-up, but I imagine it's only meant for desperate and extreme situations. The continued use of the armor has been affecting Guts' senses. His taste and vision has been affected before, and now his motor senses and precision, and even being able to grip his sword. This is so scary and dangerous, and kind of like a drug prompts more dependency on the Berserker armor. The more you use it, the more you need it, getting to the point where Guts is going to have to use it even to fight normally. I also find it funny how the boy shows up in the armor and starts to run away from it, which on the surface is super adorable, but I always said, remember when they first met the boy at the beach and it crawls up on Guts' shoulders and it starts tugging at his armor? I think the boy knows deep down that the armor is dangerous for Guts and he was trying to take it off of him. And I think the boy running here is more than just a boy being cute running away with the armor. 
but a deeper consciousness and intelligence to the boy to get this harmful thing away from his father. Also, when it comes to Casca, she has a PTSD breakdown each time she saw Guts when Guts was wearing the armor, and the armor that reflects the wearer's darker tendencies. Being without the armor or being vulnerable might be the key to being able to see Casca again, but we aren't really sure. Then we get this extremely sad image of Guts telling the boy to go back with the others as Guts hides behind a tree, unable to be with Casca and unable to take part in any of the wholesome activities. Guts, a man that has literally sacrificed his body, health, and everything to get Casca and the others someplace where they could be safe, can't even enjoy the safety and security with the others, but instead must suffer in silence. Then we get to see the finale of the chapter. As another night goes by, Casca begins to reflect on the feelings she's getting from the child and has a flashback to the demon baby as it protected her in the conviction arc, finally putting two and two together that the demon baby is now this boy. But the boy has left her bedside and ran outside, and as Casca rushes after it, and as the boy makes its way just past Guts, perhaps the biggest reveal for our characters ever happens and leaves us with the mother of all cliffhangers. The Moonlight Boy transforms back into Griffith, and the final panel by Miura features an image of Griffith in tears. And the fact that Miura was able to give us this moment, the first reunion of Guts and Griffith in 20 years since the Hill of Swords, there's something very sad and poetic about this image. And we have to go over it, so let's go over the Griffith tears here and what do they mean. I feel the need to restate this before I begin though, that my Berserk videos are my opinion and my opinion alone. This is how I am interpreting the story, and you are completely free to feel differently and interpret it a different way. That's perfectly fine and okay, but these are my videos and I'm giving you my thoughts and my opinions. Okay. So Griffith mentions how on Nights of the Full Moon, he has always had a dream of a small boy and that boy's longing for its parents. And when he wakes up, that feeling remains for a moment, but slowly dissipates. This is like any of us when we have a dream. The first few moments after we wake up, we remember the dream very well and may even have leftover feelings from that dream. But after a few minutes, the dream starts to fade away and soon we don't remember it at all. Essentially what this means is that each time the boy takes over the body, Griffith experiences what the boy does as if it were a dream. That strange out of body going along with the flow feeling that we get while dreaming. Griffith getting his body back is like waking up from said dream. As such, while waking up and within those first few minutes, Griffith still feels what the boy felt. That sadness of having to leave its parents once again that longing to be embraced by its mother. So yes, Griffith is crying, but not due to any sense of remorse or regret from Griffith himself. He has residual feelings of what the boy felt and the boy's longing. So I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, remember the Hill of Swords moment. Griffith specifically came to see Guts to make sure his heart was successfully frozen. He discarded his humanity and embraced his darkness to become a god hand. Even during the God Hand transformation, he was told that this was the final tear that he would ever shed. Seeing Guts again confirmed for Griffith that he was free, as he states. But, since the accidental fusing with the demon child, the child's heart and feelings were not frozen or discarded. They exist deep within Griffith. When Casca was in danger of the falling rocks, Griffith instinctively rescued her due to an influence of the baby's feelings. This is why immediately after, Griffith decided to leave the Hill of Swords. He recognized this weakness or this flaw within him and split before it could cause a serious problem, unaware at the time that the boy would take over his body during the full moons. So if you're asking, is Griffith capable of feeling? Yes, but those feelings are coming from the child, not from Griffith. And this makes the most sense and works the best because it's honestly very poetic irony. And it also gives more justification to the abuse and assault our characters had to go through at the Eclipse. Because if Griffith had not done what he did to Casca, out of a sense of dominance, control, and spite, the fetus would have never became corrupted. 
meaning it would never have gotten demon baby powers, meaning it would never have been at the Tower of Conviction to be swallowed by the egg and fuse into Griffith's body. It was the very fact that Griffith acted upon his human darkness, and he screwed himself and potentially the entire plan of the God Hand over because of it. This puts meaning and satisfaction to an otherwise horrible and shock value ensuing scene. People talk about the violence and rape and berserk, but I would argue that very rarely do you have a series that incorporates it in such a powerfully narrative way and actually takes it extremely seriously, having characters have ripple effects and repercussions from dealing with the events of rape and violence. It's not just something that happens, it's a world-destroying event that is the crux of what this series wrote on. The eclipse, the assault of Casca, the demon baby, it's all tied together. Griffith face to face with Guts again in tears because of what has been forced upon him. As he forced himself on Casca, he must now deal with the weakness that he forced upon himself as a result. The question is how he will act with Guts and Casca right here in front of him, and it is a question that we may never know the answer to. I have made several assumptions, one that he might want to take Casca back to Falconia with him so he knows where she's at at all times and that would mean it wouldn't risk him leaving the kingdom every single full moon when he transforms. Also we have the wild card of the Skull Knight, who we know is still on the island somewhere and how he will react to this knowledge or seeing a god hand member right in front of him. And of course what about Guts himself? Will he fly into a blind rage, or will this information of the child and Griffith being one stifle him where he's at? This is such a difficult predicament the characters are in right now in this cliffhanger, but if there's one thing that Berserk has taught us, it's that life is unpredictable. And instead of being mad that we might not have more chapters, maybe we should just be grateful that Miura gave us so much, and dedicated 30 years of his life delivering the best manga that he possibly could. And he absolutely did. Thank you, Kentaro Miura, for the story and the characters that you created and what it's meant to all of us reading along. Whether we've been following it for decades or we just picked up a volume, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and may you lay your sword down and rest in peace because you were the true struggler. And that also concludes the manga analysis series for now. If we get any kind of continuation, whether it's finishing this series or starting a sequel series, you know, I'll be happy to read it and review it. But if not, I still consider this a masterpiece. Thank you guys for all watching this video. Please like it if you enjoyed it. Also, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more Berserk manga, movie, and whatever else I decide to post here. Links where you can follow me are also down below in the description.